Welcome to Sacred Symbols, the internet's most beloved PlayStation podcast. If you want to get our show three days earlier than free feeds and completely without ads, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Colin's Last Stand. Your support on Patreon also allows you to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas to our show, gives you the ability to vote on the Let's Plays we do, allows you access to exclusive podcasts, and more. You can also buy Sacred Symbols merch by going to tinyurl.com slash sacred shirts. I suspect you'd look damn sexy with our logo emblazoned across your chest, but that's just one man's opinion. Of course, we love our free feed listening audience, too. If you don't have the means or desire to show us support on Patreon or with merch, please consider leaving us a nice review on the podcast service of your choice and let friends and family know about Sacred Symbols. We, on the other hand, will keep making Tuesdays great again. But enough chatter. Have at you. On to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 49. Whoa. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined by the disruptive Chris Raygun, who's the reason that we're a day late this week. Yeah. Posting the, and posting the podcast to Patreon. These things happen every once in a while, <laughs> though. We always post every week and we're, I, I really do take a lot of pride in the fact that we are always on time. I don't miss weeks. I don't miss episodes. Things go out even yeah. over Christmas, even over Thanksgiving. Everything's good. And when we're late, which we are every once in a while, free feeds are never late, but once in a while we have to post a day late or so because of scheduling and all this. Yeah. Uh, this was an unanticipated one. We were not able to announce this uh, this particular delay until right before it happened. So we apologize about that. But what happened, Chris? You were in, in Alberta. And, uh, uh, yeah. And I took a flight to Seattle and, I, and then I uh, a f- my second connecting flight was canceled and I was stuck in an airport for 14 hours and it was awesome. It was really Seattle, cool. Seattle airport. In Seattle airport. That's really 14 hours. I mean, that's a long time. <laughs> it's quite a while. It was kind of shocking, Colin. Yeah. I, I was f- kind of, you know, taken aback. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I don't I know. Bet. It was it was a day. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. It's fine. I'm back home. Yeah. It's nice. I yeah. survived the trip, I suppose, even though the, the, one of the planes that I got on, I can't remember if it was two or coming like going to Canada or coming from it. Had, I'm pretty sure it had flex tape on the wing, nice. which is like, OK, yeah, that's a sign. Well, if you're going down, you're going down. Yeah. Isn't that right? <laughs> now, I'm glad that you're back. I, I, I'm i happy that you're back because this episode, episode 49, we're on the precipice of episode 50, first of all, which is very exciting. It's pretty wild. Technically, we've done, I think, 54 episodes or 53 episodes because we've done special episodes. So it's not really that exciting. But it's nonetheless, <laughs> it's nonetheless, you know, something. <laughs> Just belittling it, your own. Yeah, it's belittling my own, <laughs> my own. Uh, my, yeah, milestone. That's the word I'm looking for. Jeez, I'm a little out of it today, Chris. It's because it's Tuesday that we're recording. I'm used to recording on Monday. I, I, I get ready to record on Monday. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it, it's no big deal. We're here. We're excited. E3 is right around the corner. I'm not that excited about E3, to be honest with you. It's really not that excited. <laughs> I'm actually kind of excited. You're, you're still, you know, only I'm stoked. F- only four conferences really of note. I guess five. Nintendo and Microsoft will go and then UB Square. And who am I missing? I'm missing uh, Bethesda, of yeah. course. And so, yeah, we're looking forward to that. We're going to do two episodes next week. We're going to do a whole episode on Xbox only, which I think will be really funny. A kind of a oppo research one since my, Sony will not be there. I think Xbox can have a big showing. We should do an episode all about it. We're going to. And then we'll have our normal episode go live on Tuesday all about Bethesda, UB Square, etc. So that's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah, it's going to be a fun one. It's going to be a good one. Chris, a few other things to note. Before we get into this is a long this is gonna be a long episode, I think. I you don't think know so? if that's for sure, but it feels like it's gonna be a long episode. That's a lot fair. of news. We're gonna do our E3 game <laughs> at the end of the show. As you guys know, I'm fake salty about the fact that everyone does E3 predictions. It's boring now. When we used to do it back on like Podcast Beyond, it was like an exciting thing. No one was really doing that. It was like this is weird thing we used to do. We'd make like weird bets and yeah. And now every, I just feel like everyone does it. And I like the bingo card kind of thing yeah, that's been that's going fun. around lately. That's a fun idea. That's I like a, that. definitely a fun idea. And I just felt like, you know, I don't assume that a lot of people that listen to this show, obviously, you know, 50,000 of you or so listen to this show. I assume some of you only listen to this show as far as video game podcasts, but I assume others of you listen to other gaming podcasts. And how many times are you going to hear E3 predictions over the next week? Yeah, probably, not, probably, a, probably a lot. You're not going to hear it from us. Instead... We're doing kind of an E3 word game that I've constructed, kind of like ad libs or mad libs, but mad libs, I should say. But mad libs is like a trademark. Yeah. And I'm not going to be like, put an adjective here and now. Instead, it's just like fill in the blank. 
Mm -hmm. We're going to play that. I asked the audience for in input. We're going to have a lot of fun, Chris. We're going to have a lot of fun later in the show. It's going to be neat. All right. I'm excited. A few other things that everyone should know. New Let's Play went up last week. Kingdom Hearts 3. We <laughs> did put our Kingdom Hearts 3 Let's Play up. It's finally out. You can go check it out. People really loved it. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, I, we had a lot of fun, too, I think, doing it. Uh, our next one is going to be Overcooked. That will go live next week. That's already been recorded. A new side quest obviously went up the week before. That was the history of Konami. The side quest this week is going to be all about the PlayStation Network outage of 2011. I just screened the video and it's awesome. So you're going to have that to look forward to as well. Chris, I submitted a Sacred Symbols panel request for PAX West. West. OK, OK. In Seattle, we're going to see if we're going to hear back from them. We may do Sacred Symbols live at PAX West. That's totally up to the PAX organizers. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That'll be fun, right? Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. I love so that. I, I'm confident. So here's the thing. Our show is definitely, definitely bigger than most of the podcasts that do the pack <laughs> shows. OK, so I'm not, I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be insult anyone. I'm just saying from a numbers standpoint, if you're just looking at it from popularity, we should be good. We should absolutely be fine to do a podcast there. But you never know. Right. We're the same show in which multiple publishers won't even work with us. Ubisoft. Yeah, that's true. Ubisoft just hired some, a new person from IGN who has already blocked me. So we're so I, I can't even talk to anyone from Ubisoft. Oh but my anyway, god! But anyway, the point is that we'll have to just wait and see. But that's an exciting possibility because we might be in Seattle. Well, Chris will probably be there anyway. But if we do the show, I'll be there. We'll we'll do the show, and then I'm gonna disappear like a fucking puff of smoke, and you're never gonna see me again. It's gonna be very exciting for everyone. Very yeah, exciting. it'll be it'll be quite the day. I I loved Pax West when I went. Pax is fun. It's a fun thing. Zachary Wellman wrote into us on Patreon. Obviously, Chris. If you support the show on Patreon, patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, you get the show early and ad free. You also get the ability to submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas, just like Zachary did. He said, hey, crappy Colin and Copper Penny Chris. That's not very nice to call me crappy. Yeah, I don't know if Copper Penny is an insult or not. I think it is. Oh, people take copper out <laughs> of like old houses in Detroit and sell it, though. You know, like the copper pipes and stuff yeah, like that. Copper is so, like, valuable, though, yeah, right? Isn't it? It's a commodity. Kind of. You can have copper futures and stuff. I mean, that's definitely a commodity. He said, no question today. Just wanted to tell you how disappointed I am in the both of you. Mr. Donald Duck is a national treasure. Mr. I just finished your Kingdom Hearts 3 Let's Play and I was devastated by your comments concerning <laughs> Mr. Duck. Daffy is better. Ha, I doubt it. Keep up the good work, boys. Very <laughs> offensive. I thought he would be more offensive than I thought for half the Let's Play that that was Daffy Duck. That, that was Daffy Duck. <laughs> Daffy Duck is better, though. Mr. Duck. Chris, I also got a question from Steve Neely. He wrote in. He said, hey, Chronic Colin and Cocaine Chris. Oh, well, that's hmm. I don't know if that's accurate, but all right. He says, I'm a physician. I was a guest on yours on, uh, of yours on Fireside Chats a few months ago. Dr. Neely is a radiologist, as I remember correctly. And you can go listen to that Fireside Chat. He's uh, he was that was a good episode. I was going to go to school for that. Really? Yeah. Radiology? Yeah. <laughs> My mom was like, that's easy. <laughs> Yeah, go, Chris, I could only imagine you in med school, <laughs> not from an intellect point of view, because you could definitely do it. But just from Chris in med school, Chris as a doctor. A doctor. Hey, you got a broken bone, idiot. <laughs> Holy moly. He says, so my ears perked up when you mentioned last episode, the new ICD codes for gaming disorder. As you guys might remember, we were making fun of gaming disorder, which is now a disease. You both expressed dismay at the fact that this could be taken so seriously. You should know that ICD codes are really only for billing purposes and are built to be incredibly specific, not necessarily reflecting reality or what is common. To prove my point, here are some of my favorite ICD-10 codes. W56.22XA struck by Orca. Initial encounter. Whoa. V96.03XS. Balloon collision injuring occupant. That's got to be like a hot air balloon. Yeah. He says we actually see this in, on, in Albuquerque where hot air balloons are popular. Yeah. S31.25.XD. Open bite of penis. Ooh. W220.2XD. Walked into lamppost. <laughs> V91.07XD. <laughs> burned due to water skis on fire. <laughs> In my opinion, it's a much bigger deal that the Internet Gaming Disorder is a diagnosis in DSM-5, the American Psychiatric Association's Manual of Mental Disorders. Keep making Tuesdays great again. That's so interesting. So we made fun of something, but it seems like there's plenty to make fun of. I want to I want to copy this entire thing and just keep it as just like interesting information. You could just we could just buy you a copy of the entire book. You can read it before you go to bed. That's so fun. That yeah, fun? that sounds fun. 
Chris, before we get into what we're playing, you didn't fill it in this week, by the no, way. No, because I was uh, I couldn't play anything. Oh, I was oh in right, Canada, you were traveling. Okay, and uh, when I wasn't, I was uh, sleeping in <laughs> Seattle airport. Fair enough. I just for everyone, I write this up. Ep- I write every episode, and then Chris goes in and fills things in as he needs yeah, to. I thought about doing like a clever thing, like I was playing the waiting game, and you were like, "I I, I never heard of that. What's that?" Yeah. It's like, but, I don't know. but you didn't want to trick me. I got lazy. Fair enough. I wanted to have kind of a PSA before we get into the games, though, Chris. Sure. Sony's state of play is going on right now. This is an 11 day thing that goes. Actually, it's not right now. It goes from June 7th to June 18th, June 7th to June 18th. The reason I wanted to let the audience know this is because there's a ton of like really deep sales happening during that time frame. Mm -hmm. So if you're a penny pinching consumer, as many of us are, you'll want to know this from June 7th to June 18th at participating retailers. The following things are true. Okay, PS4 Slim the Steel Edition, the, the one we talked about a few weeks ago, the Special Edition, $299.99. PS4 Pro, $349.99. PSVR Bundles, beginning at $249.99. DualShock 4 is beginning at $39.99. And so-called PlayStation hits like The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, and Bloodborne, $9.99. And newer exclusives like Days Gone, God of War, Spider-Man, etc., beginning at $19.99. So lots of really... Great deals there. You can spend not very much and get a lot of great games. Nine ninety nine for Bloodborne, something like nineteen ninety nine or twenty nine ninety nine for Spider Man. These are good deals. Yeah, for Looking sure. For a PS four Pro, etc. So go check that out. Deals for the smart consumer. Yeah, those are really good. Yeah, absolutely. So again, that's June seventh to June eighteenth at participating retailers. It's called the state of play, though. Isn't that what their things are called? Yeah, yeah. it says. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, eleven, or maybe it's called eleven days. I don't know what the fuck it's called. Yeah, Who cares? Well, whatever. It's a weird naming convention. Yeah, use it, it might for- be state of play. I might also just be on crack. <laughs> Chris, games were playing again. You left this empty. You have been busy. You were traveling. You were with friends. Yeah, you could have been playing Vita, but you weren't. <laughs> Chris, I've been playing a game that I'm gonna proclaim is the best game of the year so far. Okay, it's called Fell Seal Arbiter's Mark. Now, a few weeks ago during the, you know, at the end of every show, we read the various Mm -hmm. games that are coming out. I do this and we do this just because I want to acknowledge at least one time every game that comes to PS4, PSVR, PS Vita. Felseal Arbiter's Mark is the first game from Six Eyes Studio, which is just a two person team. I was reading a little bit about them. They worked with a bunch of contractors as well in the game. It's published by 1C Entertainment and it's a turn based strategy role playing game that is a love letter to Final Fantasy Tactics. This is exactly, exactly what I want from a strategy role-playing game. Really? Yes. So is is it like a spiritual kind of successor to it? Absolutely. It's not even trying to hide it. There's so (laughs) many things in it that, like for instance, it's after a cut scene or a story scene that the camera like pans up. That's very much what Final Fantasy Tactics does. It has classes that are all represented in this wheel, just like Final Fantasy Tactics. The fights are just like Final Fantasy Tactics. The story is very deep and very nerdy, just like Final Fantasy Tactics. This is my favorite game of 2019. Sounds like a ripoff, Colin. It sounds sounds like it's ripping it off. It's not really a ripoff because I'll say there are no new Final Fantasy. There's deck. just not that. Well, it's also that there's just not that many types of games like this. So right. someone had to do it. Oh no, I, I agree. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm busting your balls. No, I, I would absolutely purchase the hell out of a, a Shadow of the Colossus ripoff. I'd right. Be like I want that again, please. Exactly. <laughs> Anyone, please make it. Exactly. And I'm sure someone's hard at work on it right now. I'm sure. Now the game's a little expensive at twenty nine ninety nine, but I think that it's worth the price of admission. And I'm really, Chris, I'm just blown away by this game. I, I love it. I'm about fifteen hours into it. I'm playing it on normal difficulty. It's hard. The story is interesting, like I said. There's also really cool, interesting mechanical, like, kind of quirks to it. For instance, you don't use items. Like, you don't go buy items. Instead, you have, like, a bunch of items that you upgrade, and you can use them a certain time, a certain amount of time during a battle. So you have, like, a potion, and you've upgraded it so you can use the potion twice during the battle. That's it. Or you have, like, a rock that you can throw at an enemy, and you can only use it three times. So that's useful if, like, you're far away and you want to, like, do a little bit of damage, right? And so there's cool little quirks like that. And the other cool quirk I really love that makes the game hard and why I keep restarting battles and like really being meticulous about it is if your character dies in battle, he is what's called injured and he has to either sit out the next battle or he continues to be injured and his injuries get worse the more he dies basically without being able to rest. Right. So the idea is to like not die. And if someone dies, then you have to kind of like switch them out of battle the next battle and let them sit out, even if that puts you at a disadvantage. Otherwise, he can die again and then be twice as injured and so on and so forth. It's really... That's kind of interesting. Really cool. It's a lot of micromanaging kind of stuff. 
Oh, yeah, it's all equipment, abilities, job points. They're called ability points in the game. Learning and mastering all the different different classes. There's little side quests and side events. There's like a tournament that you can fight in. Dude, it's so good. That's kind of It's neat. so good. Again, you guys should go check it out. I really, really love it. It's called Fell Seal Arbiter's Mark. It's not only available on PS4. It's also available on PC and Xbox One if you want to play it there. <laughs> Colin Moriarty's game of the year. He's actually so smiling far. quite a bit, which is uh, proof because he never smiles. No, I'm not happy about literally anything. He's basically a gargoyle. Yeah, which is a shame because I, you know, I'm like the gargoyle over at Notre Dame, but Notre Dame obviously is now yeah, in, in yeah. a little bit of this. By the there? way, did you see that some of the new designs, like the oh the glass one? <gasps> Are you out of your fucking mind? It looked a little it's a weird. Thousand year old church. You better not fuck with it. I don't want to see the Louvre or whatever, or whatever the fuck, you know, like this. They're this probably going to do that glass thing, though. God. Can you it looked, uh, one, of the, one of the concepts I saw for that glass thing looked kind of cool, but I don't think it was the main thing that they were actually going to do, which kind of, it's, it's a little sad. Yeah. Well, but how are you going to replicate? But that's the thing, too. If you like, if you just redo what they did before, it's just kind of like this cheap replica of it, yeah, too. Yeah, that's it's a like, good point. There's another point where it's like, ah, this, I guess it's the same, but eh. I would leave it alone and just like clean it up and just be like, this is the... This is the way it is. You know, I got a little mad when I found out that Stonehenge, which I've always wanted to go to in England, right? Uh-huh. The, the the circular pagan celebratory, whatever the hell it is, that a lot of those stones were tipped over and that they put some of them back. Just leave it the way, it, like the way, I don't want to see it the way it was thousands of years ago. I want to see the ruins of it. You know what I mean? Right. So it'd be an interesting thing to see the ruins of Did Notre Dame. Did they clean Dame. it? Did they clean? I, I assume, I mean, Power I assume so. All the look, stones. I mean, look how good it looks, you know? The lawn is nicely manicured. I don't know. I'm not even convinced it's real. Really? I've never been there. You don't believe you believe dinosaurs walked with man, don't you? You're a young <laughs> you're a young earth creationist. I believe dinosaurs still walk with man in the Whoa. form of chickens. Yeah, they, that's true. They do. That's a good point. I always was amazed when I found out when I was younger that birds and dino- like birds are the the modern day dinosaur. It's really unsettling actually the yeah. more you think about it. Especially when you look at like a cassowary or like a like an like an emu. You know the Australians had a war with emus? That sounds familiar. It's a real thing. Did they lose? I had an Aust- I had an Australian uh, comedian friend of mine stay over my place like a week before I I left, and he told me about this emu war, and I looked it up, and he's like, "Yeah, they declared war on emus, and they lost because they were too fast." Wow, you gotta they- nuke them. Yeah, you gotta you gotta nuke your country <laughs> to get rid of all these stupid There's birds. There's nothing in the middle of Australia. There is I don't know. If you- There's nothing. Yeah, no, because it's all hostile. There's probably an alien there. Just drop a nuke on it. It's fine. <laughs> Chris, let's get into the news, shall we? Okay. There's a lot of news to get through. Yeah. Number one, Death Stranding has a release date. It's coming to a PlayStation 4 purportedly near you on on November 8th. The PlayStation blog's description of the games is brief, though it makes for a nice elevator pitch. Quote, in Death Stranding, play as Sam Bridges. What's up with these names? And traverse a ravaged nation to reconnect a fractured society and save mankind from the brink of extinction. End quote. In his own message, creator Hideo Kojima noted in part, quote, Death Stranding is a completely new type of action game where the goal of the player is to reconnect isolated cities and a fragmented society. It is created so that all elements, including the story and gameplay, are bound together by the theme of the strand or connection. As Sam Porter bridges, you will attempt to bridge the divides in society and in doing so create new bonds or strands with other players around the globe. Through your experience playing the game, I hope you'll come to understand the true importance of forging connections with others, end quote. Alongside the release date announcement came a nearly nine minute long trailer. By the way, we can talk about the trailers. I refuse to watch any of them, so I don't want to know any more about the game. I mean, honestly, I watched all of it and I still don't know. So I we'll talk about it. that in a second because I'm interested in your impressions. But I just wanted to be clear. I'm not watching any more Death Stranding yeah. trailers. Likewise, Sony also revealed information about the game's special editions. The regular game naturally costs $59.99, though pre-ordering will also get you some gold-colored components like a hat and sunglasses to wear in-game on day one. The special edition costs $69.99 and includes all of the above, but also comes in a steelbook case and digital downloads for music and music videos. The $79.99 digital deluxe edition gets all of the regular version's pre-order perks, plus more armor and other gear. And finally, the collector's edition, which costs $199.99, comes with all the digital offerings from the previous editions, the steelbook and other real-life goods, including a statue of the baby pod thing, a cargo case, and a keychain. The baby pod thing. I like that the game's about bridging society, and the guy's name is literally Sam Bridges. It's bad. (laughs) It's real bad. 
Hunter Holiday wrote in and said, hey, CNC, after watching the Death Stranding trailer, do either of you have a change of heart or increased interest in Death Stranding? I love Kojima's games, but I was not interested until I saw this most recent trailer. Would love to know how the trailer affected you got your guys hype. Keep up the awesome work. I didn't watch it, but Chris did. Hunter wants to know, Chris, what you thought of the nine minute trailer. I feel the same way as I did before. I still don't really know what it is. I have a they, I mean, they showed some gameplay snippets where they showed like an inventory system and it's like, OK, I kind of get how it would play, but I still don't understand what I'm looking at when I see it. It looks kind of like if Metal Gear Solid 5 was Breath of the Wild, almost, is what, it's, is what it seems to be reminding me of. But I still, like, I don't know. Like, my hype is just kind of the same as it always was. I'm like, I feel like the most excitement that I can muster for it is I'm interested in it and I'm very curious. But I feel like I'm not going to even know what game I'm playing until I finish it. I agree with you. It just feels like one of those kinds of, like, I, I guess I'll play it. I think the exciting thing about the game to me, not having seen the newest trailer is that I don't know what it is and I don't know how it's going to play and I don't really understand it. I think that that's like one of the intriguing things about what Kojima does. I think we can all agree on that. So yeah. it's almost the lack of understanding that drives me towards any interest in Death Stranding because the, the fact of the matter is out of all the exclusives that are announced, that's the one I'm least excited about. And it's almost, I guess we'll save the release date chatter because I think we have another question on it, but yeah, it's a surprise actually that it's coming out this soon and I don't believe it. I just want to I just want to throw that out there. I don't believe it. You don't believe it's coming out? No. November? I think I think so. No. I don't believe it's coming out in November. I, I want to be real clear about that's that. That's an interesting that's interesting. Do you know things? No. I don't know any I will be clear that I don't know anything about Death Stranding behind the scenes because it is being developed in Japan. There's right, way more right. disconnects there. So I know a thing or two about The Last of Us. I know a thing or two about Ghost of Tsushima, etc. But I don't know anything behind the scenes about that stranding. I just feel like this was an announcement that was made in the pre three environment because there's not much else to talk about. And this is the next game that's ready to go. If it tells us anything, it tells us that the last of us is not coming out this year. Yeah. And it also tells us obviously that Ghost of Tsushima is not coming out this year. There's no way that they would announce this and then say like, Oh, we have another announcement for a game coming out before this. You yeah, know, no, so, for sure. Yeah. So it looks like two, uh, we're, it looks like we're going to ride this, this year out with a few of the state of play little exclusives that we saw. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to get Medieval in October, which, by the way, comes out the same day as we're going to find out of Call of Duty. And then we're and then we're in November. We're apparently going to get Death Stranding. So it's another pretty I don't want to say another, but it's a pretty light year for exclusives. Yes, it seems not for sure. I, I, I think it's coming out in November. I just think we, we don't. I just think we feel like it's not because we know so little about the game. And it just feels like we should know more by now. I think it's that. But I also think it's just. Well, let's get into the next question and we'll, and yeah, we'll analyze right. this further. How's that, Chris? That sounds good. Brian Linquist wrote in us and said, hey, fellas, it would appear that Death Stranding is indeed coming out this year, barring any delays. Colin, I know you predicted 2019 or 2020 a few years back. By the way, someone did circulate a video that got retweeted a shit ton of times because when the game was announced, I said it's coming out no sooner than the end of 2019, but probably 2020. So, you know, look at that. You got a good broken clocks right twice a day, guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? But my question to both of you is, considering what we've seen so far of Death Stranding, does this release date surprise you? I expected full 2020, so 2019 is a bit of a pleasant surprise for me, as Kojima tends to take his time when developing his games. As always, thanks for all you do. Yeah, it is definitely surprising, but I feel like he has been taking... That's the thing. It's like, it's been a while since we've known about this this game. So it's not like it's just coming out out of nowhere. I think what's really jarring about it is that, like, most games... By the time we have a release date that's that soon... We know more about it, but I think the whole point of this particular project is to keep everything close to the chest. And I think that's what's been throwing people off. It's like, oh, well, if it was coming out in this, if it was coming out in 2019, we'd have like character breakdowns and like stuff like that, or just some of some vague kind of idea. And I guess we do have a vague kind of idea now. So I guess, it, I don't know. I'm not surprised by, I'm surprised that it's happening now, but it doesn't surprise me that it's coming out this year, if it makes sense. The timing is strange to me just because of Kojima's usual working condition, as it were, right, of being an auteur and kind of like taking your time and things being delayed. Everything he's worked on has been delayed. So, yeah, I don't know how this works. Like, this is the thing that's so surprising to me, I guess, Chris, is I don't know how this is all working. Let's, let's go over the timeline real quick, right? Metal Gear Solid 5 comes out in 2015, in, in September of 2015. So it's not even four years ago, right, by the time we're recording this. He's still a Konami at this time. Game comes out, he leaves Konami in the fall of 2015. At E3 2016, as I recall, is when Death Stranding is announced. And at that point, they're talking about how the game's like not even in pre-production. They're working on Decimo, which is basically the Horizon Gorilla engine. They're making that, you know, you can tell looking at the game that it, it runs on the same engine. It looks the same. Yeah. And 
so we we have some idea of that, but then they're constructing the team and talking really vaguely about it. And so to me, it's either Sony put a shit ton of resources in this game, which is possible, like Studio Japan or someone is working alongside Kojima Productions I think that's on it, crazy likely. Which is probable, right? We Again, I'm not really too familiar with what's going on over there right now with that. But even if that's true, and they have Decima, which is an internal engine, so they don't have to worry too much about like documentation and working on that. They understand it. It just seems so quick from... We're talking about four years about between Metal Gear Solid 5 coming out and Death Stranding coming out and all this upheaval and constructing a new team and leaving Konami and going to Sony and all these kinds of... They didn't go to Sony, but they're second party. Doesn't that seem kind of rapid to you? I, that's my, that's does my seem, skepticism. It, it does seem kind of rapid, but if it, it depends on what the kind of game that we're going to be getting is. Like, it, it looks like, to me, like, Metal Gear Solid Five was was very heavy on, like, the sandbox elements. It was like, the story was kind of like, that was the most disappointing thing about it. As far as I can remember from my personal experience and everybody else's experience was like, yeah, the story wasn't good, but man, what a game. Like, that you could just do kind of anything. And from what I've seen from this new trailer, it looks like it borrows a lot from the kind of open world kind of setting of MGS5 and a lot of... It, it just seems like a very dynamic kind of game. And I wonder how much story, I wonder how heavy the story is going to be. And if it's not, then it, there's it's quite feasible that they could just possibly just make a huge sandbox game in the time that they've had. That's true. It's really a conundrum, right? Because yeah. that's what I, how I felt about Metal Gear Solid Five as well. I played it, I think, a year after it came out. I didn't want to play it at first because I was like, I didn't like Metal Gear Solid 4 that much. And I'm like, it just, I don't I, 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 hate, I hated Metal Gear Solid 4. I just don't understand the direction this is all going in. And, and what was so funny about Metal Gear Solid 5 to me was that I loved, loved the first 90 minutes in the hospital. I was like, yeah, yes. You know, this is awesome. Yeah. This is exactly what I want. Some of the greatest Metal Gear I've ever played. And then you get into the sandbox. I'm like, ah, this is this is not for me. Right. Right. So I'm not excited about it from that perspective, because I think that Metal Gear Solid 5, from my perspective, just didn't didn't play that well compared to some other games that it was. I, I, I wanted something linear and story driven because that's what I want out of Kojima. And you might be right, Chris, because it seems like I don't want to use the term copping out because I don't think that's the intention, but it seems like they're trying to string the story by being everyone's interactions with each other, which kind of removes them as the storytelling element, even though the trailers that I've seen are incredibly story driven. I'm yeah. You know, so I, I don't know exactly. I, I guess it's, it's we're, we're talking about it. So I guess this is exactly what they want. Right? Yeah, it's hard. to. It's really hard to pinpoint what the hell this game is. I don't know. I've seen the nine minute trailer and I still I'm baffled still. I'm probably even more confused than I was before. But that's exciting from a perspective. Like when we put it in in November, if it comes out in November, when we get it, we might come. We might be surprised like by for, for better or for worse. I think we're going to be surprised. Yeah. But isn't it interesting, too, that Medieval comes again? Medieval's not a big game, but Medieval comes out October 25th. And then just two weeks later, Death Stranding comes out as well. Again, I, I just want to put it out there. I just don't believe it. I think Death Stranding will come out in like March or February. Yeah. I think they, I think now we're going to get Last of Us probably in like June next year. What a weird. And then Ghost of Tsushima in the fall. the biggest. Um, this feels like a like the biggest slew of delays. The beauty is while. that they. It, it's true, Chris, but they, they have been really smart about not saying anything. Like we don't. They've never said when The Last of Us is coming out. That's true. You know, they've never said it. Like we've made assumptions. We've made assumptions about Ghost of Tsushima. And we're still making assumptions. Like if anyone was like. <laughs> What order will these games come out? Death Stranding would have never been the first one ever on my list. So it just goes to show that you, you can't really expect yeah. what's going to happen at all times. Especially with Kojima. Of course. Nick Cottrell wrote into us and said, Dear PlayStation brethren, the Death Stranding Collector's Edition comes with various goodies, but one item caught my eye. It includes a bridge baby pod with case. You may have seen the pictures of Kojima cradling said baby with the seeming love and affection you would expect from a proud parent. My wife and I are at the age where parenthood is a real possibility within the next couple of years. My questions are, would you recommend the purchase of this in case to glow worm baby to help <laughs> help acclimate <laughs> us to the real thing? Will you two be purchasing one for sacrificial reasons? Thanks in advance for your parenting advice. Even though you do not have children, I know you can, I can count on you two to lead me in the right direction. Well, I do have a dog. Yeah, it's close. And uh, she's very well taken care of. The baby pod thing is the weirdest thing I've ever seen it's, Sony it, release. It's it, definitely strange. It reminds me of... Uh... <laughs> It's not in the same vein at all, but it reminds me of the what is it, the Dead Island collector's edition where it was like that that woman's torso. Oh right, bikini. that's right. That it's was a, a big that was a big controversy. 
I forgot about that. Oh, really? Yeah, just because... I just remember looking at it being like, that's a little weird. I remember that being a big controversy because it was, you know, misogynistic from, I guess, a certain perspective. I I, I just thought it was creepy. No, it's definitely (laughs) If you're... If if I go to my friend's house and, like, the only thing he has on a shelf is that thing, I'm like, you know, maybe I'll reevaluate this. The torso or the baby? Imagine if it was the torso and the baby and that's all he had on his shelf. The baby's a little bit... Miraculously, somehow, a little bit less unsettling. (laughs) I have a statue from manhunt the rockstar game that came out in 2004 oh yeah of like one of the pig enemies with like a chainsaw or whatever and it's so like well i guess it's so <laughs> accurate that if you lift up his little his little tunic he has like a dick and balls and oh, that's gross. that's my favorite collector's item all right that's a, that's good yeah it's good so to you put, see that on the shelf effort. Don't uh, don't invest in a glow worm baby is my advice no th- this is a weird one this is, I mean, it's cool, I guess. I just, I don't understand physical collector's editions at all for video games. I just, unless it's something that I really, really love. And I assume that some people are really, really going to love this game, in which case I understand it. But yeah, that's the thing. Are about you really going to have this baby like on your bookshelf in your living room or something? It's, it's a little weird. Yeah, I understand it. But like, yeah, it's got to be something that I think I have every Halo collector's edition, I think, with the exception of two, because they're hard to find. But yeah, I don't know. You haven't played this game yet. You don't know what the hell. No. What if you spend like all this money and you have this baby that just reminds you of like a really bad purchase? <laughs> uh, I, I would like it if the baby just always reminded you of this amazing experience you had in the game. Yeah. That would be the other side that's, of the coin. Yeah, that's the, that's the gamble I guess you take. Right. It's kind of like gambling, I guess. Yeah. You know? I would just buy the normal version of the game if I were you. Just buy a real baby and put it in there. Yeah. Put it in a fish tank. There are baby markets in this world. Yeah, there are. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. The rumors were true. Call of Duty's 2019 entry is called Modern Warfare, and it will launch on PlayStation 4 and elsewhere on October 25th, later this year. As you recall, 2018's Call of Duty was the first mainline entry to lack a single-player campaign entirely, but developer Infinity Ward is bringing it back this year, along with a unified statistical and progression experience across every mode in the game. Interestingly, publisher Activision has confirmed that this version of Call of Duty will support cross-platform play, right out of the box. Though it's been noted that because of the major advantages PC players would have in such an environment, it's conceivable that console players will be kept together. We don't know anything more about that right now. Additionally, the game will have no season pass as it shares its name with arguably the most famous Call of Duty game, 2007's Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. It makes sense to ask if this game is re- reimagining or a new game. It is being described as a reboot. So there's a lot in here. That's kind of cool. I like everything I'm hearing about this game so far. Honestly. Me too. Me too. Like literally everything. Crossplay, I love. I love that that this is happening consistently. Mm. I would uh, perhaps urge that console players be kept together, but for custom games and stuff, I would, I would, I would recommend opening that up to everybody. And what about mouse and keyboard? I just uh, can you play it with mouse and keyboard on on PS4? Oh yeah, would not be interesting. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? And then maybe the game would be able to read that and then be able to put you with the appropriate player base. That could be cool. There's a lot of stuff happening here, Chris. I think it's really cool. I agree with you. This is exciting. First of all, Infinity Ward, very well respected, although a kind of a, a shell of what it really was oh, back in sure, the day. Yeah. Reimagining or rebooting or whatever. Yeah, they're calling it a reboot of Modern Warfare, which is Ar- Call of Duty 4, which is arguably the most famous Call of Duty game. So that's that. Last year, no campaign this year a campaign again as i've heard through the grapevine there was supposed to be a campaign last year and it was really fucked up so they just canceled it so that was that's not a huge surprise i knew that the campaign would be back i heard that a long time ago yeah but i think the biggest thing here is no season pass no paid maps now this is a big deal this is a really big deal because call of duty usually has these big a couple like two or three big map bursts in the subsequent six months or eight months after the game comes out now that's going to be conceivably available to everyone for the price of nothing. They're in, a, they're in a very different environment now where the main competitors are free to play games and they have to jump in on that. They have to, they have to make their game as accessible as possible and inherently charging for more content that's going to split the player base is by definition kind of, you know, alienating. I agree. Very smart. Probably a risky move for Activision because... As we've discussed with kind of the relationship with Blizzard right now and some things going on with some of the other games, they don't have a lot of releases right now. It's a very tenuous situation there because I think what is what you're saying is true. I think they realize that their big money maker is now in an existential crisis. Now, we're going to talk in a minute about the best selling PS4 games of all time because we have a list of that now. And you'll be probably not surprised that it's littered with Call of Duty games. So th- I think they're going to be just fine. But Activision has these big expectations of a, a player base of 15 or 20 million. 
And they do have to compete with the likes of Fortnite. They have to compete now with PUBG and all these other games that are coming out. So I think it's really smart. $60 price of admission, cross play, free maps, free updates. Probably, I, again, you and I really disagree on this. I think the best gunplay in the industry. So, fair. you know, I think that you're kind of paying for that premiere experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be the big difference between Call of Duty and like Fortnite is, is you're going to get that premiere experience. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I'm excited. I about wonder it. if they'll they'll release the campaign for a cost. That'd be nice. And keep the multiplayer. Oh, I would love that. And release the multiplayer for free. I would love that. To compete. I think that'd be a smart idea, honestly. Maybe that's what's next. You know, I would love that, Chris, because I would gladly pay twenty nine ninety nine for the campaign. I don't play multiplayer. I don't think I played Call of Duty multiplayer in 10 years. Yeah. Right. So. I would love to just segment the campaign or even just zombies or whatever, because sometimes I like to play zombies by myself, yeah. too. That would be awesome. I, I think that they have to approach that a la carte situation inevitably. I think they're going to have to start doing. Yeah, they like definitely that. will. Uh, because I think people will pay for Call of Duty's multiplayer. I think they I think they'd be glad to do it. But I also think that, again, the environment's different. Also, no Battle Royale, I don't think this year. So I wonder how that no. experiment worked for them. It doesn't seem like that's going to be in this new version of the game. Yeah, I don't think it worked all that well. <laughs> That's a weird space to compete in. I mean, it didn't work for Battlefield either. Well, you're charging for a Battle Royale. Why would you? Why would anybody play it if they could just play the free thing? You know, you're the main, the, the huge, the biggest crowd of people playing those games are kids. And if they can't afford your game, then they're just going to go for the thing that they can't afford, which is obviously always going to be the free thing. Right. You're absolutely right. By the way, did you see the video that was making the rounds I retweeted this past weekend of the kid outside beating the shit out of a bush that what someone was took. that what is that so apparently I, I thought it was just, yeah apparently it's fortnite i thought it was just funny because some dude is just taking a video of this kid outside just beating the shit out of this evergreen bush <laughs> he's trying to get materials materials i guess oh my god but people it's funny because people recognize that and made the story around this video that the parents probably were like all right enough go outside and play and so he it's took just, a broom and started beating the shit out of a bush <laughs> we're in a dire situation <laughs> Forbes wrote into us on Patreon and said, hey, guys, with Modern Warfare bringing back a campaign and seemingly having a strong focus on it, does the game interest you enough to play through it? How do you feel, Chris, about the campaign? I often talk about my really positive experiences with it over the years, but I know you feel a little bit differently about Call of Duty than I do. So I'm just wondering, is this something that kind of will gravitate towards I've, you or are you going to let it go? I've never been big on on the campaigns for Call of Duty games, but I like that they seem to have a focus on it. it. That's the thing, because I never felt like there was a big focus on it. Like, even with Call of Duty 4, which was arguably probably the most, probably the, the point in history where they probably start started to stop focusing on campaign as a main thing. That was probably the last one that they actually were like, hey, let's pay attention to this. But it seems like they're actually, they actually give a shit. There's no, like, Eminem track <laughs> backing the trailer or anything showing explosions. It does seem kind of gritty <laughs> and, like, boots on the ground. And I like that. Me too. So yeah, no, I'm definitely I'm definitely far more interested in this game than I ever thought I ever would be. So yeah. Well, again, that comes out October 25th and they always hit their release date, so you can count on that. We're going to be very distracted that day with Medieval. <laughs> it's that's such a crazy why would you, I don't know, whatever. Whatever. Never mind. My buddy at PS4 Trophies who, you know, which is a great resource for trophy hunters, Brian was was saying like and actually did a poll like are is this going to affect people's interest for hardcore PlayStation audiences interest in medieval. And I, I, I was interested in that question, but I'm like, I don't know that it matters. Probably like, for Call of Duty money. comes out every fall. Yeah. And medieval's never going to sell a lot of copies. And so I think whoever's going to buy medieval is going to buy it. I don't think anyone's going to go like, huh, Call of Duty or, or medieval. medieval. Yeah, that's fair. I think if you're going to buy medieval, you're going to buy medieval. I think parents might think that though. Maybe. But maybe medieval will be an attractive game. I don't know if medieval is going to be available retail. I assume it will be. I think it's going to be a twenty nine ninety nine or thirty nine ninety nine ratchet. Yeah, kind no, of game. I would agree. Yeah, but I wonder if that will be a very attractive I think holiday just, title I, I, for 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 kids. You know? I, I still think it's just like a weird choice to put it out that day. But like, whatever. well, it's Halloween. I mean, it's the week before Halloween. I think it may, maybe you want to do it a week earlier. Maybe Why would you just do it on Halloween? You could, but I guess. Well, what day is Halloween? Let me look. I have a calendar on my phone. Well, it's presumably actually Halloween's a Thursday. I mean, are they? First of all, they can release the game whenever they want. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I guess it's really the answer. Or like October 30th. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I, I don't know if I would do that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, maybe they'll push it up. But whatever. I'm you sure, it's, I'm sure it it's probably not, I'm sure the cost of Medieval is probably not super high anyway, so. No, I bet you Medieval was made for less than $5 million. Yeah, probably, you're probably right. And I think that they'll easily make that money back. That might even be a high amount of money, actually. Other Ocean, I don't know. Again, we've talked a little bit about that studio, Other Ocean, 
I think they're in like Halifax or something in Nova Scotia or some, somewhere weird like that. Halifax? But is that even a real that, place? That's a city, yeah. It sounds like a fable city. It, like. it, it, that's a, Halifax is a weird place, a, a real place, also a weird place. I don't know. Again, they're a contract studio, so I don't know like what their workflow is or whatever, or what the quality is of what they're going to put out. But we'll see. Sony found them and we're going to find out. Yeah, you we'll, know? we'll figure it out. And maybe it won't distract us too much because I assume that's going to be a game we'll get early. So we'll, we'll, we'll look into that as well. Oliver Nielsen wrote in us, Chris. He said, I only just now became a patron only so I could write this post after listening to the Sacred Symbols number 48. Well, welcome. <laughs> I hope that you choose to stick around, Oliver. You guys were talking about Dauntless and how it's cross play between all platforms. And I'm personally not a fan of mixing console and PC players. I am completely fine with cross platform between PlayStation and Xbox because the playing field is level and all about skill. But setting people, people playing consoles up against PC players is just not fair in some cases. I think Chris can relate to this more than Colin since this is an online problem. But imagine you're sitting there playing Rainbow Six Siege, for example, and some sweaty pro league fuck comes out and triple spin backflips <laughs> and hits the one pixel that's visible from across the map while you're sitting flustered, thinking that maybe you should just <laughs> turn off the sensitivity a bit. My point is that in some games, shooters mostly, the players with a keyboard and mouse have a drastic advantage. I wanted to read this out just because we talked about it a little bit just just a few moments ago Chris but is this a problem that console manufacturers are going to have to start to approach as crossplay becomes more more kind of synonymous with the console experience because I think that you have to just give people the option to play with a mouse and keyboard in these games on console I I don't know I I think I think the smart thing to do would be just to segment the player bases based on how competitive the game is and how competitive the playlist is. If you're going to have a ranked playlist in a game that's cross-platform between Xbox, PlayStation, and PC, ideally you'd want ranked to be as level as you could possibly be. So you'd want ranked on PC to be all mouse and keyboard. You'd want ranked on console to be all controller. So that way there's no you know, huge variation in like, you know, oh, did that person have an inherent advantage? I think that's something that's that's worth thinking about. But I also think... For stuff like just if you want if there's a custom games variant or like stuff like that, like stuff that's less competitive and more just kind of social. Hey, you have PC, you have a console. Let's dick around in like a custom lobby and fuck around. I don't, I don't see why that connection should be severed just because it harms the ranking ecosystem. I just think separate ranked and social. You have way more insight into that than I do. So <laughs> I, I, de- I defer to you. I would, I would that would be my way of dealing with it. Custom games, do whatever you want. Play with whoever. But like ranked, I think, should be, at the very least, input decided. Like controller or mouse and keyboard. I wonder also, Chris, if that if this experiment, this cross-platform experiment, which Activision has, to, has incredible leverage, by the way, with the platform holder. So this is actually a big deal because now everyone below them, which is everyone, can say... You let them do it. I'm excited. I'm excited this f- specifically for Destiny because I, I know so many people who play Destiny who are fractured among so many different places that I just, I stopped playing the game because I don't have a consistent group of people to play with and level up the same character in. So the thought of being able to play with all of them without having to worry about this shit is great. Well, I, I think- would gladly buy that game on multiple platforms as long as the, the, it carries over. That's what that's what's so beauty, beautiful about this is I think that this might be kind of a an ex- experimental step, as it were, towards what I've always wanted to see out of Call of Duty and what I always wanted to see out of Madden and NBA 2K or whatever, too, which is a platform, right? And this will keep it, like you said, vibrant. You, you'll basically, I assume Call of Duty's numbers fall pretty precipitously as, yeah. the, as it goes on. But if you're taking those precipitous falls and then combining them, it's not so precipitous anymore. So now you're making some sort of environment. And I wonder if the kind of the free map thing is kind of another experiment to get some data. Yeah. You know, to see like, how, well, how, how does this affect the it, play base and all it, that? It helps keep online ecosystems robust. Like, like imagine if a Call of Duty game, like hypothetically, I think I've said this before, but like if a Call of Duty game sells like five copies on PlayStation and like two million copies on play on the Xbox, they both of those groups of people can still play online without any problem finding a, finding a match because the the player pools are consistently intertwined. And I think that's just smart. From a development standpoint, keep your game alive as long as possible. Absolutely. I think that this is really, really interesting from a genetic point of view in terms of what we're going to see out of games in the next couple of years. Yeah. Number three, the third Watch Dogs game, which was widely expected to be revealed at E3, has leaked. Word comes by way of the Nerd Mag, which found a listing for the game called Watch Dogs Legion on Amazon UK, one of the most notable leakers of unannounced games. 
The Amazon posting, which has since been taken down, states that, quote, Watch Dogs Legion is set in a near future dystopian version of London. It's a, a post-Brexit world in which society, politics and technology have changed and altered London's fortunes. London is one of the most iconic cities in the world and has had a massive influence on all of Western culture for centuries. London makes total sense for Watch Dogs as the city has one of the highest surveillance levels in the world, making this the perfect playground, end quote. We'll no doubt learn much more about the game, including presumably a release date for this fall. I'm shocked at this Ubisoft franchise. Conference. I'm shocked by this franchise. They as want to make this a thing. They, yeah. they are desperate to make Watch Dogs a thing. Clearly. Yeah. I don't think either game sold very well. I think the first game sold well, but no one liked it. And then I think the second game sold poorly, but people liked it. <laughs> that was so I think, I think that that's kind of the weird situation that they find themselves in. I had the opposite experience. I actually kind of liked the first one. Really? Yeah. I, I played it for maybe 10 hours. I found it a little... It was a cross-gen game, so it's definitely something... Like, I remember seeing it at E3. Again, it has this weird provenance of being the first next or current-gen game we ever saw at E3. And I remember being really excited about it, but I, I felt like it didn't realize its potential, probably because it was rushed out. And mm -hmm. then the second one came out, and it didn't really have a big push behind it. But I knew a lot of people that liked it. So I, I had not played the second one, and I don't really care about the third one, personally. Yeah. There's too many of these games. For like, sure. Watch Dogs is way down the list of games that I'm going to play. No, definitely. You know? <laughs> But anyway, people are, you know, some people are excited about it. I, I heard a rumor. I don't know if this is substantiated that the game is going to let you play as any NPC. Did you read that? That like basically you'll be able to like play as basically anyone on the street. You know how the game like, like you, you can in? possess people like, apparently like somehow. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you got to do something. I don't I know if that's true or not. Number four, Destiny 2's new expansion seems to have leaked. Kotaku reports that the new Destiny 2 expansion will be called Shadow Keep and a leaked promotional image says the following quote. The next chapter in the Destiny experience arrives this fall as terrifying shadows descend upon a forgotten moon. Return to the lunar surface. Journey deep into a mysterious enemy to a mysterious enemy called Citadel. I think it might, that can't possibly be right. Become a slayer of nightmares and quote. The expansion, according to the leaked imagery, will be available both digitally and at retail as there is a live stream scheduled to reveal this expansion right after this episode of Sacred Symbols goes live. Ooh. You're on the verge of learning new details. Are you excited, Chris? You are a Destiny 2 fan. The thing this with is Destiny, a big expansion. Destiny 2 is my favorite game that I rarely play. <laughs> I really love it, but I just I'm so far behind at this point. Well, maybe this will, will this maybe reset It'll the probably, field? Yeah, I'll probably get sucked into it again. It's just there's something about that game that like maybe it's all the micromanaging and all the fact that like all my friends are on different platforms that just makes it so unappealing. But that's really the only thing about it. Like I wish like I don't know. It's a good game that I just wish I had more people to play with. Well, maybe we'll have you know Activision again. Well, actually, Activision is no longer the publisher of Destiny. Yeah, I exactly. guess that makes it that makes this interesting because this will be Bungie's first self-published update to the game. Oh, yeah, that's right. A little I'll bit. probably play it for that for that reason alone. Yeah, I want to support them or whatever. Mm hmm. Number five, the long awaited open secret Avengers game in development for quite some time at Tomb Raider Studio Crystal Dynamics is finally going to be revealed at E3. Word comes by way of the Avengers official Twitter account, which notes that Marvel's Avengers will be shown for the first time during Square Enix's E3 presentation, which is during the evening of June 10th. One piece of new information we got is that the game will be both single player and co-op, but that's about all we know. The artwork that came along with the tweet also throws IDOS Montreal's name into the mix alongside Crystal Dynamics. This isn't a huge surprise, of course, as the two Square Enix owned teams previously worked together on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and their involvement was previously, though quietly, noted. IDOS Montreal was previously known for the Deus Ex series. Primarily, Crystal Dynamics, of course, has long been behind Tomb Raider, beginning in 2006, and previously developed games like Legacy of Kane and Gex. Ah, Legacy of Kane. So we have that to look forward to as well, the Avengers game. Yeah. And by the way, I did look up the original trailer. They did put out a trailer for it. They did? It, it, yeah, it's not just like some rumor that just came out. They actually did oh, a okay. CG trailer. Yeah. But, oh, so they did confirm that Crystal... See, this is a kind of where my confusion starts to set in because I don't know what the fuck anyone's telling me anymore. Yeah. I'm like, is this a secret... <laughs> Or no. not. And then like sometimes in my mind, I'm like, no, I don't know. They any showed it at an E3 or at a PAX or something like because I, I Googled the trailer recently just out of curiosity. And like, yeah, it, it exists from like a couple years ago. I've definitely said stuff on this show and other shows that I do that were definitely secrets that I thought, were, <laughs> that I thought weren't. So some people have picked them up. Some people haven't. Number six, June 2019's free PlayStation Plus games have been revealed. If you have an active PS Plus account, you can download Borderlands, the handsome collection and Sonic Mania for free. You should have until the end of June to do so. Remember, you should add these games to your download list even if you don't intend on playing them anytime soon as you'll be able to download them for free down the road if you still have an active PS Plus subscription. I know I say this every month, but I cannot stop stressing that. Go add the games to your download list. 
There is no reason not to do it because yeah. you might want to play them later. Yeah, I got to pick up uh, the Handsome Collection. Well, there you go. It's free. Borderlands The Handsome Collection is a compilation of Borderlands 2 and Borderlands the pre-sequel, while Sonic Mania was an all-new classic-style Sonic game released to great fanfare in 2017. I had the audacity to insult Sonic Mania online when they announced this, <laughs> and people were quick to remind me that Sonic Mania is actually one of the well-regarded Sonic yeah, games. Yeah, apparently it's a good one. Of course, again, just like that Stranding's release date, I don't believe you. <laughs> But I wanted to acknowledge that it's as good well. for a Sonic game. I'll put it that yeah, way. Whatever that means. Number seven, according to a post on the official PlayStation blog, Sony is seeking out participants to test out new party chat and audio functionality coming soon to PlayStation four. People have already been privy to f future firmware updates in beta form for a while now, but this update is newsworthy as it appears Sony is aggressively tackling issues in regard to player interconnectivity. Most notably, party chat will now accommodate up to 16 players instead of eight, and those who sign up are, and are chosen will be given 20 codes so their friends can try it out with them. Perhaps most fascinating is that Sony is also working on chat transcription, which will automatically turn voice chat into text for those that need it. And apparently you can use it on like a second screen, which is pretty cool. So basically you can be playing a game and then have your phone or your tablet and it will transcribe text and you can read it as you're going in case you are, you know, deaf or you just miss something, right. whatever the case might be. I guess that the word of deaf functionality will not be very useful for this podcast since you can't listen to it if you're deaf. Yeah. We should get someone to transcribe the podcast. Yeah. That would take forever, probably. Yeah, probably forever, especially for an episode like this. <laughs> probably also not worth the uh, trouble to go through. But nonetheless, this is interesting. Now, I was thinking about this, Chris, from the perspective of 16-player voice chat. I can't even think of 16 people in the world that I want to talk to ever. So can you imagine having 16 people in a voice? Like, I don't even know who would be in that voice chat with me. <laughs> My mom? The, yeah. You? I think Xbox. Lola? I think Xbox had like 10 or something, but it, it re re really rarely ever. I think the most I've ever had in like a player, uh, like a party chat is probably like like seven maximum if we're doing like a Destiny raid. You know what I mean? Like a like an actual thing. But it's usually just like three people. Seems chaotic to me. Yeah, it seems 16 like 16 people. Well, at least it's not like 100. <laughs> That's party chat too, right? Which means that you could all be playing something else, right? Yeah. It's like fucking heinous. It's weird. Everyone, like you could literally have 16 people playing 16 games talking to each other. It sounds horrifying. It, it is bizarre. Yeah. Uh, it's been a while since I've used it. You know what, Sony? You keep that one. Number eight. It looks like Apple and PlayStation are getting into bed. Well, kind of. As reported by website The Verge, Apple is rolling out support for the DualShock 4 controller, specifically in regard to Apple TV. Meanwhile, over on iOS, DualShock 4 will be supported as of the rollout of iOS 13. This means, according to the website, that players will no longer have to use shitty Bluetooth controllers to play. Also note that if you prefer, Xbox One's controller will also be supported. It's pretty cool. Yeah, kind of neat, I guess. I would like that. For, I don't have an Apple TV, but I feel like that would be incredibly useful for Apple TV. Yeah. Less so if you're playing games on iOS or Android, although The Verge did note that people do play Fortnite on your phone. Yeah. And so you could theoretically connect your DualShock 4, set up your phone. And have at it. Yeah, and just mop the floor with a bunch of people who were, who, who the hell would who play. Who were fucking. playing on a touchscreen. So yeah. there, there you go. <laughs> That's, right. That sounds fair. Super weird. Number nine, Media Molecule is prepping the first patch for Dream's early access on PS4. And by the time this podcast goes live, the patch will be ready to drop. According to a PlayStation blog Europe post, Media Molecule is launching an all new art kit called Ancient Times, as well as two new games into the arcade section of Dream's called Combo Crush and Comic Sans. S-A-N-D-S. That's good. Yeah. I like that. The patch also fixes a bunch of issues as reported by players, including the ability to block users, better search functionality, and more. Now, we continue to get lots of, not lots, but some feedback from Dreams that it's just really great, but I'm going to continue to say, don't know who it's for. Yeah. I'm so glad that everyone's making other games in Dreams. That's that's all I've ever seen. Someone made X-Wing versus TIE Fighter in Dreams. It's like, okay, <laughs> cool. You know, the, the, you know what would be really neat, though, Chris, is if this, so... Do you know what Net Your Rosie is? Does that sound familiar? No. So in the 90s, Net Your Rosie was this PlayStation 1 console that Sony released for $800. It was turquoise. Actually, it was like a dark blue. And it was a dev kit. And, oh. and certain games came from it. I think like Devil Dice and a few other games actually came from it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know the name of it. I, I've seen that model, though. Wouldn't it be neat if they were looking at Dreams submissions and they like took the cream of the crop, the best two or three, right? Yeah. That aren't licensed or whatever, but that are just these fresh games. And they made game, and they were like, "We're gonna release this as a game." I think yeah. that's kind of the low key point of it. Honestly. I think you might. I think I, you might be right. I think it's probably like a way of being like, "Hey, you know what would be good if we didn't flood our store with indie games, but just made a game for people to make indie games in." 
Ooh, wouldn't that be fun? Tin foil hat. God, uh, this actually does make dreams kind of intriguing because what if dreams became a marketplace, mm -hmm. like a Unity style marketplace where people were selling. And Unity, by the way, I mean, I don't mean Unity, small U, Chris knows, but Unity. The, the game the, the game engine and yeah, like the, the engine, platform. Exactly. Yeah. There's a marketplace where people sell assets for Unreal or for Unity or whatever. Wouldn't it be cool if people can make like lots of money? I think that's the most interesting thing about it to me. It's like, it's definitely not something that I can do or oh, use no. very well. But I, I do like the, just like the, the base environment around that game is kind of, is like super fascinating. And I wonder... Like, if it pans out, that could be a really cool thing. If it doesn't, then, like, whatever. They try it or whatever. But, like, it's it's very intriguing. I'm still of the mind that Dreams, quote-unquote, early access is what we're getting. Dream, this is Dreams. Like, mm. they're not going to remove... Like, they'll eventually remove the moniker, I guess. But you're getting... This is the game, I think. And what was interesting was that... Remember in the original blog post when they announced the early access, Chris? They said something really fascinating, which was that it's going to be limited. They're only going to sell a certain amount of copies of the mm. game. I don't know if you remember us talking about that, but we did. And so I wonder if they've not hit that peak yet. Like they've not announced it. In other words, like I can go on PSN right now and buy dreams. And so that seems to conflict with the side. They should have never said that because it makes the game seem unpopular, I guess is what I'm saying. Because right. They did say like, we're going to have a cap and we're going to, it's like, well, you didn't hit the cap clearly. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, that's that's a, I don't know if that's a good sign. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Number 10. A spokesperson for the MPD group, which tracks game sales in the United States, revealed the best-selling PS4 games overall since the console launched. The top 10 best-selling games based on dollar sales, both digitally and at retail, are in order. Grand Theft Auto V, which is not a native PS4 game. That's actually a PS3 game. <laughs> yeah. Red Dead Redemption 2, which came out six months ago. Call of Duty World War II. Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Spider-Man. Call of Duty Infinite Warfare. God of War. NBA 2K18, which is super interesting. And Battlefield 1. Spider-Man and God of War are both exclusive to the console, putting it in between Xbox One's lifetime software sales, which has no exclusives in the top 10, and Nintendo Switch's uh, lifetime software sales top 10, which is made up of all Nintendo exclusives. It's interesting. Really fascinating lists if you look at them side by side. Yeah. All 10 Nintendo games are Nintendo exclusives. None of the Xbox games are, are Xbox exclusives. Only two of the Sony games are Sony exclusive. It's very strange. Really interesting. Now, so many Call of Duties. Also, wow, Red Dead. Red Dead. I'm fascinated by Grand Theft Auto V, which came out on PS3 and Xbox 360. And then it was re-released. Right? You know? It was 2013 that they came out, right? Right, exactly. Maybe? And then it was re-released, I think, in 2015, I want to say, or 2014 on, I think it was 2015. I think it was released a year later. And then a like, year, later, and then a year afterwards, they had like some PC port, I think. It's really remarkable, man. It's like, insane. It's also on do based on dollar sales, so it's not based on cumulative units sold. So you have to assume Grand Theft Auto 5 has been sold at $20, 30 $40. It's really remarkable. NBA 2K18 is the biggest outlier to me. That's so weird. It is NBA definitely like, 2K it's the only sports game there. But it's uh, that's so fascinating. One year's sports game. No one buys NBA 2K18 anymore, and no one bought it before it came out. It was like, it was on sale basically for nine months, right? Before it like, wasn't relevant anymore. That's unbelievable. Maybe you maybe that's why you don't want an NBA 2K platform because you're selling 15 million copies of the game every year. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Anyway, really interesting stuff. Number 11. If you're interested in buying Minecraft story mode on PS4 or downloading a copy you have already bought, you better act quick because you're almost out of time. Developer Mo Yang and publisher Microsoft revealed in a blog post on Minecraft's website that story mode, which was originally developed by Telltale Games and spawned and spanned two full episodic epi uh, seasons, rather, is being taken down for PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4 and PS Vita and every other platform beginning on June 25th. The blog post notes that as Telltale acted as the game's publisher, this move was inevitable. So if you own the games, download them before June 25th. If you haven't purchased them yet already, you may already be out of luck, but you can try. This is what people have been concerned about with digital games. I have to say that you guys are right. Yeah. And I was totally wrong about this specific concern because I was always like, what is the no one's going to it would be crazy for you to remove a game. There right? should be some like something in place for this. It's it doesn't seem right that this is even possible that it, you can just make a thing and then it just goes away just because like can you imagine if. <laughs> You know, if America disappeared when George Washington died, <laughs> like what? I don't know. There's something weird about it. Like, it, I don't know. They, they should set something up. I don't know what you would set up, but something, yeah. needs, to, something needs to happen because this is it's not fair that like art of any kind like this just vanishes. I think the argument they make, Chris, which is fascinating to me, is that you when you buy a digital game, you're buying a license. Now, this is the argument 
Well, I don't even that, care about owning it. Yeah. I don't, it's not necessarily for me, like, the owning it part. It's more just, like, the fact that this thing that a lot of people worked on is just now just gone. You know, that doesn't happen with films. Or no. really anything. No. I want. I think that's not with music either. Hopefully they publish it. They might have published it in a hard copy, which might be the only way you can probably acquire it now. I'd have to look. I think Telltale has typically re- re- you know, released everything on disc. Yeah. I agree with you. I think it's really strange, but I think the license argument is really interesting because it's very dubious. Like it's basically saying you buy the license to download this game and then at any moment we can just remove it from the store. That's my biggest thing is that I don't have a problem. With they say like this is not for sale anymore. We have licensing issues. It's not for sale anymore. But if you bought it, you can still download it like it's still in the back end. And that's what they're saying here basically is that it's gone. Like the game's gone. If you bought the game, you're not gonna be able to download it anymore. It's like PT, right? Where and PT wasn't for sale, but it's the same situation where like a PS3 with or a PS4 with PT on, it's actually valuable because you can't acquire it. Yeah. You know, and that's even a more interesting case because there is no physical copy of PT. So uh, I, I do feel bad for the developers and publishers, too. But I wish that they would figure out a way, Chris, to just work around this licensing issue so that. When you purchase a game, maybe the maybe the license, the ability to purchase a new license disappears, but you still have the license in perpetuity. Yeah, that's what's unfair about it to me. Yeah, no, definitely. Because what if you just the, I don't want to b- belabor this point, but what if you were like a guy that like a few years ago was like, oh, I'll buy this and put it away in your download list under, and you'll just buy it, you'll play it later. People do that on Steam all the time. Yeah, and I do it on PS. I have like fucking seven hundred games on PS4. You know, so now someone's gonna go back in like twenty twenty two, be like, oh yeah. I downloaded, a, I bought Minecraft Story Mode. I haven't played that. And then they go in on their PS5 and it's just fucking gone. Now they have to go online and it's just a, it's a problem. Yeah. It's like when you go back to a porn video and then it got taken down. Oh, you're like, damn. The worst. Not For that sure. I know anything about them. Yeah, me neither. Number 12. <laughs> if you're a European or Asian listener of Sacred Symbols, be on the lookout for increased pricing on PlayStation Plus subscriptions moving forward, depending on what type of subscription you have and what country you live in. PSN Profiles, the ever-useful trophy site, which I absolutely adore, has a thread that compiles various users' emails from global territories confirming the price increases. The European European countries that will apparently see price increases include France, Germany, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland. Asian countries that are seeing increases include Japan, South Korea, China, Thailand, Indonesia, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. There have been no reports of price increases for the United States, Australia, Canada, the UK, Benelux, or other major territories. The fuck is Benelux? Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Weird. Yeah. They're treated as like one common territory for launches. I don't know if other companies do that. I I think that's a common term that's used like elsewhere, but Mm. I learned that term from PlayStation. Yeah, I just learned (laughs) Number 13, believe it or not, since it's launched back in late February of this year, Anthem has only been updated on nine occasions, with six of those focusing on bug fixes and issues with loot. However, three updates brought in some new features, missions, and more. And the most recent update, the first in nearly a month, brings along new free play related features. This includes three all new missions, as well as a ton of fixes and tweaks to javelins and gear. Critically, the scant updates and deafening silence about the game doesn't mean the promised Cataclysm event isn't still coming, because it is. Announced and then delayed, developer Bioware finally spilled the beans on Cataclysm during a live stream, which the website uh, website Kotaku watched, tracked some key reveals and announcements, and then let us know. Cataclysm itself will last six weeks, though the overall event will last eight, as so-called pre-events for two weeks will lead into the core six. The event will take place on a unique map, broken into smaller, non-linear sections that can be explored Mega Man style, with roving rewards that keep players coming back for the duration. It seems to be a sort of time attack or score attack take on Anthem, while cha- with chasing high scores and extended play times the key to getting better loot. As Cataclysm is meant for end game players only, an additional five levels of loot will be included in Cataclysm, making much of its gear the highest end available. So Bioware is putting like it seems like one major push into this. Mm-hmm. And by the way, by, I think Anthem wasn't on EA's streaming schedule for E3, and I think it's actually been put back on because I think the optics of that were horrible. To not have the game included in their E3 show. Yeah. At all. So what do you think of this, Chris? You think it's too little too late? I, I'm done with it. I can't see myself going back. Maybe I'll like... They would have to pull something crazy for me to like reinstall that game. <laughs> I just... I don't know, man. I just didn't feel it. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people are. And I think that you're seeing a lot of, again, anecdotal evidence that we've discussed in weeks past that people are even having a hard time finding especially what's interesting early game players yeah. because it's basically attracted cataclysm is going to attract the people that are still there. Yeah. But apparently it's very hard to get into it now. Apparently it's very hard to get help. There's very few new people coming in yeah. and it's like bad sign, but definitely bad sign. And I, I think I also heard earlier today, I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard somewhere that they deleted their roadmap 
Really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, uh, I don't know. So, here, I'm going to put this all out on the line. I don't know that this is true. Again, let's keep this in. Let's put it all in the in the context. Yeah. Anthem is one of the best selling games of 2019. For sure. At $60. So, I don't think EA lost money on it. I don't think Bioware is going to be like closed up or anything like people are, are, you know, fearing. No. I do think that EA is going to pull the plug on Anthem by I, uh, the end of the summer. I I don't think it's going to. I don't know if by the end of the summer. End of I the year, they, maybe? End of the year, for sure. There's no way this game's lasting into 2020. I would be I would be absolutely shocked if they don't say, hey, listen, work on the next thing, please. <laughs> it just, I don't know, man. What a what a disastrous line. I can't think of like as I'm thinking about it, it's it's just it's worse than 76. Like the more I think about it, like actually. And I didn't think that that was possible. It is. It 76, is 76 was just 76 was broken beyond repair. But at least it was like a thing. <laughs> Did you see the Todd Howard in, or hear the Todd Howard quotes from the IGN interview that they did? Uh, when them? he said like they knew that it wasn't ready for gold or whatever. Right. I, I wanted to. I was going to include that originally in the podcast, but since Bethesda is doing, I'm, I'm sure Bethesda is going to talk about Fallout 76 at E3. So they I was have, like, they have to. So I was like, why don't we just wait? Because they do have a road, like a substantial roadmap that yeah. I wonder what the, if they're going to be able to meet too. But man, it reminds me that. So for people that don't know, Todd Howard gave an interview with my buddy Ryan McCaffrey at IGN. He does a really great series called IGN Unfiltered, which I really highly recommend. Yeah, I like him. Yeah, yeah really, really nice man. And uh, a, a buddy of mine, when I when I worked there, I remember, I remember when he was hired. He was actually hired to compete with Greg and I uh, when we ran PlayStation because PlayStation used to dominate IGN coverage so much. As people might recall, when I ran the site, yeah, he was brought on as the Xbox. Guy, he was brought right? on to like basically it was all friendly, but he was basically brought in to be our internal competition. To be yeah. like, we need a guy who knows Xbox, like Colin knows PlayStation, for instance. So I've always been really friendly with him. He he was a really nice guy. So anyway, go check out his series. But one of the quotes that they pulled out of it, Chris, was that Todd Howard was basically saying like that they knew <laughs> that the game wasn't wasn't ready, and that they and I he said I think that they knew it wasn't going to be have a good Metacritic score. You have some fucking audacity, yeah, to say that. Whether or not it's true is another story entirely. I think you'd have to be an idiot not to know that that game was going to score badly. But you have to have some fucking audacity. To talk to people and say, we knew not only was this game not ready, but we knew that the game wasn't good. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me? It's it's pretty baffling. <laughs> That's why I want to give them a chance at E3 to write something in, because I'm sure that they've already done the script and stuff like that. But to write something in to talk about this, because that's not good. They Yeah, they have to address this for sure. That I think sometimes people take quotes and really blow them out of proportion. I think people do that a lot with like Randy Pitchford. Not I think this people, one. No. I think if anything, this was blown under proportion because it's basically a creative director at a major studio who released a horrible game on purpose saying we actually knew we took your $60. We didn't say a fucking word that the game was subpar. Now, if he came out and said, listen, we realized late in development that this game was fucked. And so we, we precipitously dropped the price and released it at, for $19.99, you know, or $29.99 or remember the rumors when it was going to go for free. Yeah. And have some kind of PR massage instead of saying we have this is what's going to be the problem with Anthem this is why I brought this up the problem with EA shutting down Anthem is that people paid for it and the problem with Bethesda walking away from Fallout 76 is that people paid for it yeah and so this is the double-edged sword Chris of releasing these kinds of games is that you can't like Avalanche we, we keep making fun of making fun of Je Generation Zero right Avalanche can walk away from Generation Zero and be like whatever you know it's we, we, the game sucks. We delivered the game. It has no online component. It doesn't matter if we pay any attention to it. People can buy it. It'll exist forever. Anthem needs to be supported. It yeah. has to have at least servers. And the same thing with Fallout 76. So when you release a game like this, you have to also think about the back end where you're almost paying twice the cost as a publisher because you're basically saying, if this game isn't good, then we are. it is impossible for us not to support it because then we lose an optics game too. So not yeah. only do we take people's money, then we just shut the game down. It's a very precarious situation, which is why I think people really need to think harder about releasing these kinds of games. Because and this also, is the situation they, people like, need to I'm think sorry. about no, but also people need to think harder about buying them too. Yeah, like this is like well put. People should uh, well put because I knew well before Anthem was even remotely coming out that there was there was going to be some issue with this. Definitely, like it was it was clear as day. It's actually shocking how many people weren't expecting it. You can't say that we weren't expecting it. You can go back and read all of the shit I wrote on Twitter, too. Yeah. I said in December when it was clear EA was nervous about Anthem that EA was nervous about Anthem. Yeah. And obviously, Jason, Kota uh, Jason Kotaku. We'll just call him Jason Kotaku. Jason Kotaku. <laughs> His great reporting on Bioware situation really illuminated 
exactly what we had feared, which is that this studio can't make this kind of game. And why EA ever asked them to make it is fucking beyond my comprehension. And by the way, the same situation with Fallout 76, though again, I'll note that I do not believe that Bethesda Game Studios made it. Just throwing that out there one more time yeah. for everyone. Because if Bethesda Game Studios made Fallout 76, then there is, I just wanted to say this, no reason for you to be excited about Sky or Elder Scrolls V or six, or whatever the fuck it is, and no reason to be excited about Starfield because Fallout 76 is a disaster. Yeah, I don't believe it either. I so don't believe they made it. That's that's actually the triple-edged sword now because not only did they release, have their, their sister studio in Austin make a game, clearly, then they released it, it wasn't ready, then they took credit for it. The fuck are you thinking? Uh, you know, how... This is exactly why when Rage 2 was announced, everyone's like, it's making Rage 2. I'm like, no, they're not. And why Bethesda was so quick to say, oh, no, they're not. Well, I guess, this, well, I guess this is the difference between publicly traded companies, right? Probably. This is why, why Bethesda's always had that weird kind of like independent style to them. It's like they don't have anybody higher up telling them that they shouldn't be saying this stupid shit. Yeah, ZeniMax is their parent and they're so big. It reminds me of when Fox owned IGN when I was there. Fox had no fucking idea what we were doing. No, no. they probably, you probably didn't receive any notes from no. Fox. They would come and lay off people every year. That's what would happen. <laughs> then we would just hire a bunch of new people and have a bigger staff. So I had no idea what was going on there. I saw Rupert Murdoch once. He walked through the office once. So that was weird. But other than that, Fox had no idea. And when we were sold, uh, our CFO made the point that like we are so that he made the point. I remember, I'll never forget this as long as I live because it was almost like insulting to IGN. <laughs> Where I was like, when we when they were spinning us off and selling us, or like when we became an independent company, he was like, Fox is this big skyscraper. And he had like a bit, and he's like, you are the fire hydrant outside of the skyscraper. That was basically the illusion, like the the illustration. Yeah. We were like, thanks. But it was basically to illustrate that they had no idea what we were doing and didn't even know that they owned us. And I expect with ZeniMax, which is a big umbrella corporate entity, that Bethesda is just like, yeah, doing whatever, you know? So it's not like a it's not like a carefully curated statement from a Bioware right rep. It, you exactly. Know, it, it's this is like it's just Todd, <laughs> and he's just like yeah we oh, whoops we we knew it was bad whoops. They you know I'm friends with some of the guys over at Bethesda, and their PR Pete Hines is in charge of their PR and marketing who's probably one of the smartest if not the smartest single marketing yeah. PR guy in the entire industry has been with Bethesda since the 90s. So a guy that's been there forever knows the company in and out. I feel like they're making a lot of blunders lately. But he's also just Todd, though. That's the thing. It's like, you can't, yeah, I guess you can't tell Todd what to do. You can't do. tell Todd what to do. That's the that's the double edged sword of having a company that's like pretty transparent and independent. It's like you always, sometimes it's like nice and refreshing, but other times it's like probably shouldn't have said that. Dude. Yeah, no, definitely. Hey, interesting little note about Zenimax. Donald Trump's brother is on the board. We talked about that last time. Oh, did we? Yeah. They should stop smoking weed. Number 14. It was only a few months ago that Konami revealed that three old school compilations would be coming to PS4 and two of them, the Arcade Collection and the Castlevania Collection, are already out. The third promised compilation is called the Contra Anniversary Collection. And while we don't yet have a firm release date for it other than sometime this summer, we do finally have the full game lineup, which we were lacking until now. While the Castlevania Collection toted eight games, the Contra Collection comes packing ten. That said, some of the games included are different variations or ports of one another. Three of the ten games are versions of the original Contra, the 1987 arcade version, the 1988 Famicom version, and of course the very famous 1988 NES version. Players will also be given access to the 1988 arcade game Super Contra, as well as its 1990 NES port Super C. For SNES, players will receive 1992's Contra 3 The Alien Wars and its European counterpart Super Probotector Alien Rebels. Uh, Probotector, of course, is Contra in Europe. For Genesis slash Mega Drive, players will get 1994's Contra Hardcore and Probotector, the, the same game from different regions and under different monikers. And finally, rounding things out is Operation C, a Game Boy exclusive Contra game that launched in 1991. I have never played that one. Yeah, no, uh, me neither. I'm looking forward to this Contra collection. I don't know who's handling it, and I'll be interested because different companies handle the two other ones. I'll be interested to see if this has a platinum, which, of course, they dropped the ball on in a major way in Castlevania. Let me just put this in the fucking terms, Chris. Everyone can understand. <laughs> I don't love anything more in video games than classic Mega Man and classic Castlevania, right? Mm -hmm. Capcom releases two classic Mega Man collections with no platinum trophy. Konami releases, releases a classic Castlevania collection with no platinum trophy. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> He's got a chip on his shoulder, but it's very important. That really bothers me. Not because they were not platinums per se, but those are the game. Those are like collections that are Colin collections. Yeah, exactly. And you just maybe they knew that. Maybe they don't like you, and they're like, you know, what would really piss Colin off if we just if we just didn't put a fucking platinum in this trophy. <laughs> fucking assholes. Now, 
when Mega Man Anniversary Collection came out, it was in 2015, I think. And I actually have a, as people know, I have a challenge in the game, which is really cool. But I remember talking to Capcom about the trophies and I offered to make them the trophy list when the game was still like being developed. And they told me that it was impossible for them to put triggers in the games, which I think I discussed before. And I was basically like, you guys are full of shit. Yeah, what does that even mean? That's, that's, that's what games are. They're it's triggers. Nonsense. It's complete nonsense. I remember them telling me that and being like, that's fucking nonsense. I remember like being like, that's nonsense. That's what a game is. They're like, we just put triggers at the end so it knows you beat every game. And I'm like, well, that's weird because there's a million retro games with platinum trophies, but okay. Well, if they can choose where they put them in at the end, then they can put... Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, it's, it's, that's, it's, that's a baffling... <laughs> that's a baffling excuse. Noise the shit out of me. And by the way, the Mega Man X Anniversary Collection had a platinum trophy. So, whatever. Number 15. The previously revealed Gunvolt game, Gunvolt Chronicles Luminous Avenger IX is coming to PlayStation Jesus 4. Christ. As well as Switch, where it was originally revealed. The side-scrolling old-school shooter will come to PS4 and elsewhere on September 26th and costs $14.99. Gunvolt Chronicles is the latest game in developer Any Creates Gunvolt franchise, which began with Azor Striker Gunvolt on 3DS back in 2014. A sequel, Azor Gun Striker Gunvolt 2, came to 3DS in 2016, and there are some spin-offs as well. Any Creates is best known for its work on Mega Man 9 and Mega Man 10, as well as on the Galgun series. It also did that awesome Bloodstained 8-bit Castlevania 3 ripoff. I wanted to note that just because I'm a big Gunvolt fan, and we've never gotten the games on PS4, and I have been begging them for a long time because I know those guys. Uh, I'm, I'm especially uh, friendly with their their Western community manager. And finally, we're going to get something Gunvolt related. Finally, dude. Really, really you neat. got it. Really neat series. If you guys own 3DS, and I'm sure a lot of you do, go check it out. Really, really interesting side-scroller, Mega Man-inspired, really fun. Is the 3DS a good console? No. Okay. I don't think so. Yeah. I, was the, I own one, but I was... I have like three games or four games for it. So yeah. It. Now, Nintendo DS. I love the that DS. That was primo. I really love the Nintendo DS. Actually, now I think about it, I really love the PSP and the, and the Nintendo DS. That was a great generation Those for handhelds. That yeah, was a great. The mid-aughts. Yeah, so good. I, I remember So I, I remember playing DS for the first time in 2005. My friend, uh, Lewis, who had, who went to Harvard, lent me his DS so because I had jury duty. And I remember just being obsessed with New Super Mario Brothers uh, on there and, and was just blown away i know? played super mario 64 for the first time on, on oh. the ds some good ports on there that one that was uh, amazing Majora's Mask amazing is on there and, and or i think not Majora's Mask. um ocarina, ocarina of time maybe yeah. i think ocarina was 3ds actually oh you're right now i think about it you're right you're absolutely but right. still number 14 number 16 this is a wrap-up website gamatsu reported a ton of release date information for upcoming ps4 games as well as on some delays so here they are Visual novel compilation Data Live Rio Reincarnation has been delayed until late July, having previously been confirmed for June. RTS game Northgard is coming to PS4 at some point this year. It looks pretty cool. Adventure slash role playing game Bug Fables has been revealed and will come to PS4 later in 2019. Platformer meets RTS game Smelter is coming to PS4 in 2020. 2D Metroidvania game Warfinder has been announced and is coming to PS4 later in 2019. That's another good looking one. Strategy game Tactical Galactical has been revealed and is coming to PS4 later in 2019. It's a great name. Jumanji the video game has been announced and is coming to PS4 on November 15th. Visual novel Raging Loop is PS4 bound in the West in 2019. Gamatsu also reports, and this is a big one, that Square Enix is publishing Dying Light 2 and that the company has filed another collection of Mana Trademark, this time in Europe, all but confirming a Western Mana compilation of some sort. So Dying Light 2 is going to be at the Square Enix conference at E3 or during their video. That's one of my most anticipated games. That's a big one. I thought Techland was going to put that out by themselves. So they have some publishing help. Website Push Square reports that hookshot centric Verlet Swing is coming oh. to PS4. So it's a game based around a hookshot, apparently. That's perfect. That's that, awesome. That platformer Even the Ocean is coming to PS4. And all, and the website also points out that Journey, arguably Sony's most famous indie exclusive, is coming to PC this very week. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Publisher WB, WB announced that World Combat 11's Combat Pack DLC, which costs $39.99 and gives access to new, six new characters and 19 new skins, is now revealed. You can go pre-order that if you want. Among the new six characters are Shane Sung, Spawn, and others. Or Shang Sung? How do you, I don't even know how to say that. The ESA has revealed E3's panel listing for this year's show. One of the panels is about Darksiders, all but confirming that one of THQ Nordic's E3 teases is a new Darksiders game. We talked about that last week. EA has announced that it's bringing out a new Need for Speed game by the end of 2019, though it won't be at E3 or officially revealed until later. Developer Phoenix Labs has announced that free-to-play action RPG Dauntless, which just launched on May 21st, we talked about it earlier, has already surpassed 6 million players, with many of those hailing from PS4. It looks like Ubisoft is going to announce a new franchise at E3 called Roller Champions, according to leaks. 
though little else is currently known about it. Shenmue 3 has been delayed from its August 27th release date and will now come out on November 19th, according to the dev team on Kickstarter. And finally, The Surge 2 has a release date and will launch on September 24th on PS4 and elsewhere. I want to play the original Surge. That was yeah, free on PS Plus a little while ago. It's supposed to be really good. Yeah. Apparently, it's like it was like a pretty good like middle market kind of game, right? Yeah. And it was, yeah. And I'm kind uh, of interested in that. Just out of the, I feel like I'll just feel nostalgic for that kind of game. I think I, I think about it. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if it's true, but I think it's a middle market loot driven action RPG. That seems neat. I think. I'm down to try it out. Chris, it's time to re- read the new game releases for How the week. How many we got? We have a lot. Oh, but Matthew boy. Hamilton wrote in and said, can Chris please read the drop in his Dr. Engine impression? <laughs> no. The world needs this. What is that? <laughs> no. So <laughs> I've been fucking around with uh, in Premiere in like my editing software. I found out uh, there's a character in Crash Bandicoot that has a very specific, the original games, there's a very specific vocal effect on his voice that I thought was really neat and I, th- I tried to replicate it and I did but that requires editing Oh, and I do not feel like doing it because otherwise it's just an Igor impression oh okay and that's not fun fair enough sorry Matt sorry denied Chris you want to go first or second uh, I'll go first because the second one looks like a like a freaking aneurysm yeah Effie comes to PS4. Effie is a 3D action adventure game that combines classic elements from the genre with the exploration of an expanded world Live a unique fantasy adventure, free the cities from a powerful and dark evil, and relive the look and feel of old school video games. That game's supposed to be pretty good, but I haven't played it myself. Kododama, the seven mysteries of Fujisawa comes to PS4. Welcome to Fujisawa Academy, where nothing is as it seems and every pupil hides a dark secret. After making a pact with a demon fox, allowing you to see the truth (laughs) behind the lies, infiltrate the secret of Fujisawa Academy and uncover the sinister truths behind the seemingly normal facade. And I appreciate here they use the uh, little uh, hook under the sea in facade. Yeah, that's cool. I don't remember the name of that in French, but anyway. Legend of the Tetrarchs comes to PS4, a fantasy RPG with turn-based battles and dungeons in beautiful pixel art. That's a good sounding point. I like pixel art. Me too. The holy sword that's sealed away in ominous power has been drawn out and, and darkness starts to spill out across the land, mutating people into monsters. A grand, fin- uh, grand fantasy tale is ready for you to save the world. MotoGP19 comes to PS4. The official video game of the most popular motorcycle championship in the world is back with a new chapter full of surprises. Challenge your friends, create your custom events, and become a race director. Thanks to the most complete multiplayer experience ever. Neon Junctions comes to PS4 and uh, PS Vita. Neon Junctions is a first-person puzzle platformer imbued with atmosphere of synthwave and 80s. Nice. Uh, Capture and move conductive cubes, close electrical circuits, and restore power uh, of uh, the interactive objects around you. Get to the teleportation plant to advance to the next level. Pixark comes to PS4, and that's P-I-X-A-R-K in capitals. I got an email about this game. Really? Yes, yeah, it is weird. That's cool. Welcome to Pixark, a vast wild world filled with vicious dinosaurs. Oh, there you go. Magical creatures and endless adventure. To survive in this mysterious land, you must tame creatures both ferocious and cuddly. Craft high-tech and magical tools and build your own base out of cubes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Refunct comes to PS4. Uh, Refunct is a peaceful, short, first-person platformer about restoring a vibrant world, featuring an emotional soundtrack and an open world without death. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's funny to me. <laughs> uh, relax and play at your own pace without pressure. No sweet release for you, my kinda, friends. That sounds interesting, actually. First person platformers, I, I just can't do them. That's what Titanfall is, kind of. Yeah. If you think about it. Oh, by the way, the winning Let's Play for the last month is Titanfall 2, you helping me earn the Platinum Trophy. In the game. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. That, oh, the, the, the uh, what, what is it called? Uh, yeah, it's like a, yeah, it's like a race that I like. That's like I the can last do one. it. I'm I'm sure I can do it, but then you're gonna have to live with that shame. That I I'll got try it myself. Plan. You'll coach me, and then we'll see. It. We'll, we'll go from there. I mean, they voted for it. There's nothing I can do about it now. <laughs> All right, let's let's get it. Stunt Kite Party comes to PS4. Stunt Kite Party is a family-friendly single-player and couch co-op multiplayer game with an exciting storyline and numerous game modes. Step into the shoes of a young and talented kiter. I didn't know that was a word. As he journeys through the colorful world, can you and your friends convince the mayor to legalize kiting again? <laughs> wow, that last sentence like, came out of nowhere. It's like Footloose, but with Kiter. <laughs> Kiter sounds like a slur. I don't like it. I, I don't like it either. All right, this is an interesting. Yeah, it sounds like something a British person would call someone. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Get out of here, you fucking Kiter. Kiter. It sounds so dirty. I know, it sounds like you. I don't like it. It sounds sexual. Let's stop. Okay. <laughs> Super Blood Hockey comes to PS4. Great name. 
Arcade Sports Gaming gets a shot of adrenaline in Super Blood Hockey, a violent homage to the classic 8 and 16-bit ice hockey games. Customize your lineup and take to, to and take to the ice using fast-paced skills and bone-crunching brutality to dominate. I'm going to check that out. Either. I like that. Yeah, me too. Sounds cool. <laughs> Super Blood. I mean, 16-bit hockey is like the best. Super Skelomania comes to PS4. Dive into Super Skelomania, a single sitting Metroidvania about an acrobatic skeleton. Jump over a pit of thorns, roll your skull like a bowling ball, and headbutt a spider like any good skeleton would. That's really interesting. Single setting Metroidvania. I've only played one other game like that, which was, what the fuck was it called? Uh, Zeo Drifter, which mm. is on PS4 and Vita, where it's like a one sitting Metroidvania, like an hour and a half or so. It's kind of interesting, yeah. yeah. The Legend of Heroes Trails of the of Cold Steel 2 comes to PS4. The second title in the definitive JRPG uh, Trails of Cold I keep I wanted to say Trials. Trails of Cold Steel series uh, makes its way to the PS4 for the first time, taking place immediately after the first game's dramatic conclusion. Uh, Rain must work tirelessly to right the wrongs that have led the country of Ero, 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 Erebonia? Erebonia? Yeah, I guess to disarray. Little... I apologize. I'm bad with JRPG stuff. Oh, I can't wait until you read the next one you have on, on the list. Now, oh, God. Now, this is supposed to be an excellent series for JRPG fans. Just throwing it out there. I haven't played it yet, but, but highly recommended from people I trust. The Savior's Gang comes to PS4. A self-proclaimed savior must travel through numerous ancestral locations guiding these worshippers to reach the promised land. The numerous dangers that these locations present will make it very difficult for all that worshipper or for all. What does it say? Difficult for all that worshippers to survive. That's what it says. I didn't write that. So the last sentence one more time says the numerous dangers that these locations present will make it very difficult for all that worshippers to survive. That is definitely not uh, accurate. No. As far as English goes. No, certainly not. All right. Uh, (laughs) uh, Toki Juju Densetsu Mm. uh, comes to PS4. Uh, Toki sets off on a new adventure. The cult action uh, platform game originally released on arcade machines in 1989 is back. With a Super Simeon new version. Did I read that right? Yeah, Simeon? Super Sim- yeah, I don't know all why. All right, a Super Simeon new version uh, featuring all new hand-drawn graphics and reorchestrated music. That wasn't so bad. No, that, you, did, you did well on that one. That I, did, I did read the title in my head 15 times before I said <laughs> Toki was delayed for a long time, this re-release, and uh, it's supposed to be pretty good. Again, I don't know for sure. Densetsu means, I think, adventurer or like legend in Japan, in Japanese. So. Yeah, I think you're right. Warhammer Chaos Bane comes to PS4. In a world ravaged by war and dominated by magic, you are the last hope for the empire of man against the chaos hordes. Playing solo or with up to four players in local or online co-op, choose a hero and prepare for epic battles wielding some of the most powerful artifacts of the old world. Sounds like Gauntlet. Word Wheel by Paugi comes to PS4 Another and Paugi. PS Vita. Another Paugi game. Another Paugi game. The classic Word Wheel puzzle goes digital. Uh, find as many words as you can from the letters shown, always using the middle letter. There are 100 puddles, puzzles to solve and 100 groan-worthy jokes to reveal. Great. Yeah, they keep releasing games. Paugi yeah. on PS4 and Vita. God bless Paugi. Uh, nothing super noteworthy this week for me. Again, I've heard good things about Effie. Let's see. I think Neon Junction is one of those garbage platinum games. Legend of Heroes, obviously. People are going to want to check out Toki. So a few things for you guys this, year, this week. But again, pre-E3. Everyone's just preparing. Yeah. And speaking of E3, we're getting rid of reader mail. For this episode only. Just this once. And instead, although the readers, and I don't know why we call you readers, but we like to do that. They uh, submitted a bunch of things. So what we're going to do here, Chris, is I've created 10 fill in the blank scenarios Yeah. for us. And then I gave them to you and I filled mine out and you filled yours out. And then the audience submitted theirs. They're very simple, very straightforward. You can be zany. You can be serious, whatever the case might be. I intended on being funnier than I ended up being. <laughs> so I'll throw that out there. But the audience has submitted a bunch of really funny ones. Oh, yeah. So let's go through these one by one. Okay. And we'll, this is basically going to act as our E3 predictions, but instead of, you know, straightforward E3 predictions, we're going to have a little fun with it. Okay. Sounds good to me. Chris, number one, Sony not being at E3 is a blank. Ooh. Sony not being at E3 is a blank. What do you say? I say it's a blessing. Sony not being at E3 is a blessing. Yes. Why do you say that, Chris? Because I I don't have to, because now people won't be like, Oh my God, did you see that amazing Sony conference? It was better than literally everything I've ever seen. I'm going to talk about Kingdom Hearts for the next 14 oh, years, no. and I'm going to be excited about it forever until it comes out, and then I'm still going to be excited about it for some reason. Isn't it a relief that we don't have to play Kingdom Hearts anymore? That's not hanging over us. I'm excited. I say Sony not being at E3 is incredibly wise. I think that this is a wise move for Sony. Yeah. Disappear for a little while. 
Just vanish. Let Xbox go first. You know, and last, I guess, technically. Yeah. This year. They've actually moved. I actually have it written down. They uh, yeah, they go at 1 p.m. on Sunday this year. They usually don't go at that slot. They usually go Monday morning, as I recall. Yeah. So everything's all mixed up this year. It's strange. So I say Sony not being an E3 is incredibly wise. I think it's really smart for them to stay away. And I think it's really smart for them to announce everything at PSX. I think it's really vital for them to make PSX into something. And that's PlayStation experience for people that don't know. Reveal PS5 at PlayStation experience. Make yeah. PlayStation experience the fucking thing to be at. No, exactly. This is what you want to do, in my opinion. Some of the submissions we got, we only got one that I wanted to write on here. We have a bunch for the other ones. Jonathan Rice said, Sony not being an E3 is the wave of the future. Ooh. I actually kind of agree. Yeah, probably. We'll see. What, Number- if, they come, what if they just come back next? <laughs> they probably will. Number two, without Sony at E3, I'm afraid I'll be blank or blank. Chris? I had no idea what to put here, so I said, uh, <laughs> without Sony D3, I'm afraid I'll be assassinated or arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I say, without Sony at E3, I'm afraid I'll be disinterested or go to sleep. Ah, oh. Now, there's stuff happening. There is stuff happening. We still I got feel- Bethesda, which should be an inter- a fascinating show. <laughs> I'm interested in Ubi I'm, as well. Yeah. That's going to be such a, fasc- a fascinating show, I feel like, because they have so much to address. And they can't just sweep it under the rug. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, I, I am being a little harder than usual. I think what was exciting, though, is that Sony usually went last. Nintendo usually went Tuesday morning, so it didn't count. And they still, I think, do. But out of the big guns in that kind of ecosystem, Sony would go last. So everything would kind of be leading up to that. Mm-hmm. A little bit of a different feel now. I always hated that arrangement, though, because then everybody would like it would just be like they won by default. Right, every year. It was the last thing, you it was saw. The last thing everybody saw. Like, I remember even watching some of the Xbox conferences that were pretty good, and everybody was like, that was shit. I was like, what do you mean? That was pretty good. What? Baffling. I don't know. Maybe I just hate Kingdom Hearts. (laughs) Well, I do too. But again, you're taking that out on... on, You should be taking that out on Square Enix. No. (laughs) Zach Higginson wrote a note and said, without Sony and E3, I'm afraid I'll be speculative or anxious. Ooh. I don't see why. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. It's E3. Chris, number three. Can you think of a less ang- anxiety-inducing time? Than yeah, I don't know why you'd be anxious, but I understand. He, he, he's excited. Yeah, that's fair. Number three. A Sony-less E3 means that blank is going to blank. Chris. Hmm. A Sony-less E3 means that Xbox is going to do okay. <laughs> Probably. I, I have a similar one. A Sony-less E3 means Microsoft is going to steal the show. Yeah. I expect that Microsoft's going to have a great conference, and I think that that would be true regardless of whether Sony was there or not. Yeah, I think Microsoft's going to. So, again, we're going to do an episode all about Xbox because I think the Apple research will be really fascinating for us and for the audience, Mm -hmm, especially with Sony's silence. But I think we're going to see the new box. I don't know if we're going to see it. They're going to talk about it openly. They're definitely going to talk about it. Well, they already kind of have. Right. But I think they're going to name it. I think they might even put a date on it. I think it might even be out this fall. I think I think I think I think there's an acceleration going on with Microsoft. Do you agree? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be out this year. I think I think it's still very much a 2020. Interesting. We'll see. Mm hmm. I'm welcome to be shocked, though. Remember, Xbox 360 came out a year before PS3, but that wasn't supposed to happen. PS3 was delayed. Yeah. No one really knew that until much later, but PS3 I was think, supposed to happen. I think they also kind of want to hit the 2020. I think that's just a good marketing year. It is a good marketing year, but... I think they might put it out. Is it possible it comes out in, like, March? I think that's possible. Yeah. I think that's actually way more possible. I think it. they got to go first. I really do. They probably I think will. they have to get out of the way. They will go first, but I don't think they're going to go first, like, a year's difference. Right. You're probably right. Ken Vielen said, a Sony-less E3 means that the vocals on Twitter are going to act like Xbox can't be stopped until Sony blows everyone's mind on their own day later in the year. Well, fair enough. Brandon Kurzitter said, a Sony-less E3 means that PSX 2019 is going to be epic. Yeah. I agree with you there. Roman uh, Karaman said, a Sony-less E3 means that Google is going to take advantage of the opening to talk about Stadia and how revolutionary they think it will be. They are going to do that. They confirmed that they were going to be there yep. or something that they were going to do a stream or something. I can't care. No, I don't care. Either. I I forgot about them entirely to be completely honest. I think that thing's dead in the water to be honest before it even begins. But again, Google either right. has big successes or big failures, right? I think, I think, I think you're right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any faith in this. Number four. I think that blank will have the best E3 showing because blank Chris. I think that Bethesda will have the best E3 showing because their expectations are so low. Nicely done. <laughs> 
I, well, dude, low expectation. The so, what do they call? What, what is it? The soft expectation. Soft. Oh, actually, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations. So it's not bigotry. It doesn't really apply here. No. But low expectations. Let's say the soft expectations of low expectations. <laughs> yeah. I say, I think that Microsoft. The soft the, blessing of low expectations, maybe. That might work. What is it? The soft blessing of low expectations. Yeah. Okay. There you work. go. I think that Microsoft will have the best E3 showing because it must. Mm-hmm. That's so, valid. So that's what I say. I think that. I mean, here's the other side of the coin. What if Xbox's conference sucks? That would suck. Holy shit. I mean, they have to deliver the goods here. Yeah. Have to. Have to. Have Expectations to, have to. are pretty high for them, I think. They're enormously high. I don't know that they've been any higher since 2013, Probably. which was right after they revealed Xbox One and had to clean that mess up. Yeah. So I think E3's con- or Microsoft's conferences are typically pretty good. They're well produced. I think that Spencer is a really talented speaker i think he's got a lot of authenticity yeah. i think he's got like a lot of charisma lot. especially cons- uh, compared to what what's his name matrick oh my god i couldn't stand matrick sucks i was big in xbox and i no one no one in that community liked him do you know that don matrick when he was after he worked at xbox he was ceo of zynga yeah and, and then he, he jumped fl- and he would yeah but he would also f- have he would fly i think he lived in seattle or something like that and would fly to san francisco like once a week on a private jet oh my god no wonder they were losing money <laughs> fucking terrible company. All right. Not not Microsoft, uh, Zynga. Phil Crone wrote into us and said, I think that Devolver will have the best E3 showing because they get how ridiculous most E3 press conferences are. Yeah, but you can also have, I don't know, the whole self-awareness thing only works so long. I agree. I don't I don't find Devolver shtick especially appealing. I thought I it was funny the, the first press, time. Yeah. But like, you know. Yeah, now it's, uh, I don't know. It's don't, like a Family Guy episode. It's like, okay, I get it. Just cut away. Right. <laughs> Caleb Greer said, I think that Bethesda will have the best E3 showing because it will just be them apologizing on stage for 45 minutes. <laughs> and Matt Freimeyer says, I think that Devolver Digital will have the best E3 showing because it's probably going to be batshit insane. We'll see how it all goes, I guess. Number five. While I hope that Square Enix's showing is blank, I wouldn't be surprised if it was blank. Chris? While I hope that Square Enix's showing is exciting, I wouldn't be surprised if it was blatantly homophobic. Wow. <laughs> Holy moly. That's interesting. I'm not even going to ask you about that one. I, <laughs> I want to just keep that one hanging out there forever. That's a good idea. Like, I don't know. No one knows why you think that. Why? <laughs> I really did treat these like madly. No, you have to. I mean, I, I, that's what I said is I want when I wrote them, I wanted to be funnier. And then I'm like, well, I, I guess I should actually be somewhat serious. Well, I hope that Square Enix is showing is bearable. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a gigantic waste of time. Now, yeah. I think that last year's, they do a Nintendo style, Direct style thing. I think last year's was very judicious in terms of how much time it used. I think it was very efficient. Yeah. Very efficient. But I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have, because Final Fantasy VII Remake, they just showed. Kingdom Hearts is out. So like the big, they're not going to show Dragon Quest XII. They're not going to show Final Fantasy XVI. So they have other stuff, of course. Avengers. Yeah, they'll have Avengers, which is big. They're going to have now Dying Light. You know what I bet? I bet Kingdom Hearts is still going to be there somehow. God. I, I actually, I am so sure of it. I don't know if I can handle that, to be perfectly honest with you. David Merlino wrote in and said, while I hope that Square Enix is showing is not complete dog shit, I wouldn't be surprised if it was complete dog shit. Holden Shaj... Sh- well, this is a this is like a Swedish one. SJO Showstrom, I want to say. While I hope that Square Enix is showing is not delayed, I wouldn't be surprised if it was simply too big to remake. That's probably one of the best ones we've gotten, by the way. I love that. Love that. Just to read it one more time for all the everyone out there. Well, I hope that Square Enix's showing is not delayed. I wouldn't be surprised if it was simply too big to remake. This is, of course, a <laughs> Final Fantasy good. VII reference. I like it. Dustin Germol- Germolowicz says, well, I hope that Square Enix's showing is highlighted by the Final Fantasy VII remake. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Final Fantasy XV remake. I would probably kill myself if Square Enix pulled that move, just to let everyone know. Kyle Bernier said, well, I hope that Square Enix's showing is full of cocaine and strippers. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. Thank you so much for that, Kyle. Chris, number six. Electronic Arts meager live stream means that the publisher is blank. Electronic Arts uh, meager live stream means that the publisher is homeless. Mm. We're going to leave that one hanging as well. <laughs> Destitute. Desti- <laughs> Electronic Arts <laughs> meager live said. stream means that the publisher is drowning. That's what I wrote. Oh, yeah. I think that the publisher is in a weird space where it doesn't really need an E3 presence at all. Probably not. It annualizes a bunch of its games. And even the games that it doesn't annualize, it annualizes in some way. Like Need for Speed comes out almost every year, right? Yeah. 
and obviously Madden, FIFA. I don't know that. Like, we know. We get it. And, yeah. and the fans are going to buy the game. But I'm also happy that they're not parts of the bigger... Like, I'm, I was happy when... Uh, I noticed a distinct slowdown in how many mentioned sports games would get in like the main like PlayStation and Xbox conferences because those were always the worst parts of those conferences because I just had to sit there and be like, oh, okay, I got to, f- all right, I'm going to tune out. I'm going to get a drink at this point because I don't care. They're going to talk about f- FIFA for 10 minutes. Yeah. They bring out like a soccer legend or a football yeah. legend or whatever. And it's, it's like, like, I know that guy uh, vaguely. Yeah. It's like, it's cool. I think Pele was there once. Yeah. Like Pele was there. Deal, but Pele announced Peggle 2. So. Yeah, Pele comes out and announces uh, Command and Conquer iOS. <laughs> so I just think that EA is the kind of company, like Activision doesn't have either press conferences because there's no reason for Activision to have an either press conference. They have a Call of Duty game every year. They have all these the support structure that, you know, that releases these games and, you know, Blizzard and all this kind of stuff. So I, I it's funny you say EA, it shows EA is homeless because I actually think that that's kind of poignant, even <laughs> though you meant it as a joke. Oh, no. Adam Laws wrote in and said, Electronic Arts Meager live stream means the publisher is shitting the bed. Possibly in real time, they are. That was supposed to be two days, by the way. Shitting the bed in real time. Real, Yeah, in real time. <laughs> because I think that they're adjusting in real time to Anthem. I, I think that For this sure. is like not going the way that they thought it was going to go. Although, I don't know how you could, like Chris said earlier, I don't know how you could have looked at that game and not imagined that it was going to go that way. Chris, number seven says, it's hard to imagine Bethesda blank, but it sure would be blank. It's hard to imagine Bethesda making Elder Scrolls 6 look exciting after Fallout 76, but it sure would be a miracle. (laughs) I like that. Chris, I say it's hard to imagine Bethesda beating its 2015 show, but it sure would be timely. So people will remember that Bethesda was never at E3 until 2015. And what, what happened at E3 2015 was that we thought Bethesda was going to have a one-off showing, that the, everything kind of aligned for them where they could show a bunch of shit off and then they were not going to have a show again for a few years. But they kept being there. And I think that their showing has actually gotten weaker and weaker as a result. So it would be timely for them to have something that even beat in some way the 2015 show, but I don't know how they would ever do that because what would they have to show? Now, it's important to note that Mikami is apparently going to be at E3, indicating that the Evil Within 3 is going to be revealed. Mm-hmm. I think it's time for that. We're obviously going to see Wolfenstein, but I don't know what else is going to be there. Joseph Parastatitis. I'm sorry if I butchered that. Said It's hard to imagine Bethesda upgrading their engine, but it sure would be nice. <laughs> Sean P says, it's hard to imagine Bethesda announcing Starfield 2 and the Elder Scrolls 7, but it sure would be nice to know that they're still committed to making single player games. <laughs> I like that one. That's pretty good. I like. <laughs> Jeff Scott wrote in and said, it's hard to imagine Bethesda doing anything of importance or success this E3, but it sure would be neat. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jeff. <laughs> I was thinking of neat too. Trent Miller wrote in and said, it's hard to imagine Bethesda showing a meaningful E3 showcase, but it sure would be cool if they had some gameplay of Starfield not running on that old janky engine. They, Guys, definitely, they definitely don't. They definitely don't have that footage. Stephen Oslin wrote in and said, it's hard to imagine that Bethesda will, that Bethesda will show another version of Skyrim, but it sure would be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if they say the word Skyrim even one time at this conference, I'm going to fucking lose it. I don't want to see there or hear about that game. First of all, Skyrim's just not that good. I'm going to throw that out there, okay? It's not that good. It's not this revolutionary game that Fallout 3 was. There are a million better fucking RPGs at this point. Well, now, Skyrim. yeah, for sure. Let's I think in 2011, it was pretty great. Not on PS3, it wasn't. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. That was rough on you guys. Know your audience, Chris. <laughs> Chris, is it possible that Xbox blank... Is it possible that Xbox doesn't show Halo? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no, not possible. Impossible, actually. Chris, I ask the question, is it possible that Xbox bombs? Yeah, I think it's possible. I, I, I would be I would be kind of shocked. I think it's kind of unlikely. I think they're going to be I think they're going to please most people that are looking. I think watching. so, too. I don't know how that would happen, but I think anything's yeah. possible. They would have to be like Halo Infinite. Battle Royale only. <laughs> and they were like, what? That would be that would be actually horrendous. I think I, would, I think I would stop watching. They announced that Halo Infinite has Battle Royale, right? They no. announced that right? Oh, well, it does. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind it if it was part of it, but like... Didn't we talk about this on this show? No, we didn't. We talked in private about oh, it. Oh, okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Budding wrote it in and said, Is it possible that Xbox does a surprise release of Gears 5? No, no, that's not going to happen. Although there's those other Gears games that are in development. Oh, yeah. And so maybe they released one of those Gears games. The, that's like, possible. The, the, they did like they do one with Funko. Funko, yeah. 
That's uh, yeah. They, they that's I could see that happening. But Gears Gears is definitely a fall release. Yeah, Gears Five. Them. I think it looks good. I, I actually well, I don't know if you know this about me. The audience that's been with me for a long time knows I'm actually a Gears of War fan. I actually like Gears of War. I like Gears of War too. Jason Gardner wrote in, is, is it possible that Xbox acknowledges that it's been Sony's bitch this generation? I think that's impossible to acknowledge that. Although I think the, first of all, I don't think that's really true, but I think the, the proof's in the pudding, you know? Yeah. Avery Ilias wrote in and said, is it possible that Xbox shows off a modular console? Chris? Hmm. I think it's very possible. I think that's, I don't, again, I th- this year, no. I so think you think that the Xbox will be modular but I, they won't talk about it? I think, honestly, I, I think we're likely to see modular stuff, but just I, I don't imagine them showing hardware this year. I think I'd be genuinely shocked by that. Yeah, I, I don't know that they're going to talk. They're not going to show the box, but I, I really do think they're going to talk. They're going to talk about specs, I think. They're going to do the same thing that Sony did with that weird uh, private presentation where they were like, Spider-Man loads! Yeah. <laughs> and, but like, I don't Isn't know. Isn't that incredible? Did you see that, by the way? Yeah. That's really, because uh, we talked about it when Wired wrote that piece, but seeing it, no, seeing like, it happen is pretty. Like, Holy it, shit! No, yeah, that's really, you know, like that. Uh, wow, it's yeah. really impressive and that's really cool. But I think they're probably going to talk about that, and maybe maybe they might even show something like that running. You know, I don't know how they would how they would really get that across. But they would just they would literally have to show the game running on the new Xbox and the old Xbox, I guess, but side by side, right? Yeah. The, you know what was funny when I was thinking about this with Chris with these instant loads? This is concurrent, by the way, to Sony filing uh, patents about this, so this is clearly happening, and. I was like, the splash screens and the intro screens for PS4 games are going to be longer than the load times now, which is a problem. going to be a fucking really annoyance for me. You know how like you have like all the splash screens take like 20 seconds, and then the game loads for like two minutes. Now the game's going to load in like one second and it's going to take 20 seconds to actually get to the load. Yeah. That's going to become annoying. So it's actually going to be really fun with the new games because I bet you games are going to start. Do you remember Killzone? Shad- well, you, did you play Shadowfall? I played Shadowfall, yeah. So the interesting thing about Shadowfall, I don't know if people remember this. Games didn't end up doing this. Is that Shadowfall loaded immediately. Do you remember that you turn it yeah. on and it would immediately go to the start screen? Like that was just what it went to. And yeah. I remember seeing that because that was a launch PS4 game. I was like, holy shit, it's really cool. But then no one like did that anymore. It's really weird. And so now I think they're going to have to go back to that That'd because be cool. of the way the games are going to I would like that. I like me, that very much. Me too. Amon Tamar. Oh, wait, did, did we read? Oh, no. We have one more for this one. Ron Chastain wrote in and said, is it possible that Xbox becomes the new media darling, assuming their briefing knocks it out of the park? Yes, hmm. I think it is possible. I think so. Possibly. I think they're in a pretty good position, honestly. They're in a great position. Yeah. I mean, this is all lining up perfectly. Yeah. It all obviously hinges on how they make their plays, but you couldn't ask for a better setup than this. No. People are A lot of people are excited about Halo again, which is like kind of like shocking. And they're in a position where they got all these new studios working on stuff that people are excited about, even if they don't know what it is. They're, They're in a good situation. Number nine. If I were in charge of E3... I'd blank to make the show more relevant and popular. If I were in charge of E3, I'd hire go-go dancers to make the show more relevant and popular. Wow, it'd be like a late 90s E3. Yeah, exactly. Go back to your roots. (laughs) If I were in charge of E3, I'd up the ante to make the show more relevant and popular. How so? Get NASA in there? I think you gotta gotta make the show tighter, like two days, and I think you have to up the ante by making it more, which they've been doing over the past few years, making it a consumer-based show. Because sure. it's really not a E3 is really not a great place for what it used to be great for, which is people signing games and seeing shit. Now that kind of stuff happens at PAX. That's why Sony sends like fucking 50 people to PAX so they can sign shit. So, yeah, I think E3 has got to embrace its consumer focused. It's it, it's just it's not a useful show anymore the way it used to be. So I think you got to up the ante. I think you got to compete with PAX. I don't think you got to you can't make E3 its own special thing anymore because it's not. It's actually kind of not a big thing anymore. You know, I don't like know, man. I still think I still think it is. We're gonna find out. We're gonna find out who's right or wrong. I know. I think you're right that it's that it's dwindling, but I still like it's also kind of like one of these things where it's like it's like the NFL. It's constantly hemorrhaging money. It's like one of these things. It's like ah, eh, it's it might be shit, but I love it. What do you mean by the NFL? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. What I'm talking about it's it bullshit. The NFL's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Amon tomorrow wrote in and said, "If I were in charge of E3, I'd rename it to C squared to make it more relevant and popular." Ooh. Johan Ivan Bobrovsky, that's a, quite the name, wrote oh, in and said, if I were in charge of E3, I'd be shitting myself because I wouldn't know exactly how to make the show more relevant and popular. It's another problem, too. We discussed it last week that I think another major thing is that ESA, which is the lobbying body for games in Washington, also runs E3, which makes no fucking sense. That's so, really weird. So that's another thing is that they got to split that off. They shouldn't be. Apparently, half of ESA's total profit comes from E3, which is not good. They only have 48 members, I think. 
like the publishers. So they have to have E3 in which to rely upon to make money. And so they find themselves in a weird situation. And I actually think that that's part of the reason why E3 still exists is because if it didn't, then it's possible the gaming's lobbying body would cease to exist. And that would be bad, especially right now as they're trying to get loot box legislation through. Yeah. Which I'm sure they're freaking out about. Finally, Chris, number 10. E3 2019's game of the show will be blank because blank. E3's uh, 2019 game of show will be Knack 3 because Knack 2. Wow. This is really weird that you said that. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. First, though, E3 2019's game of the show will be something from Nintendo because the press is biased. That's my answer. (laughs) Now, Chris, let's see what else we have here. Danny Garcia said E3's game of the show will be Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order Mm -hmm. because midichlorians. I'm excited about it. I keep forgetting about it. And That's I keep the big thing excited. that EA is going to show. Yeah, I'm sure. Ryan Murdoch says E3 2019's game of the show will be Doom Eternal because Chris. Oh, indeed. I'm excited. Ah, that's I'm so another excited. one that's going to be a Bethesda show. We'll probably get a date for that as well. Yeah. Moise Khan wrote in and said E3 2019's game of the show will be Cyberpunk 2077 because duh. Mm-hmm. That's going to be that's going to be a big, a big one for sure. Now, rumors are circulating that the game was aiming for the end of this year, which is really surprising, but has been bumped to next year. I think we'll get a release date. John Peck wrote in and said E3 2019's Game of the Show will be Monolith's Game of Thrones because why not? <laughs> They're making a Game of Thrones? No, I think you just made that up. <laughs> and Neo JD said E3's Game of the Show will be Knack 3 because Chris himself will announce it. Oh. Where will they announce it, though? That's an interesting coincidence. Is that weird? That is kind of weird, yeah. How did you like that game? Knack? No, oh, I hated it. I meant more of the predictions game. Oh, <laughs> everyone hated that. What did you think of? What did it you think? Fun. Of us, that was different. I like right? it. A little different. Yeah, it's definitely better than just fucking just predicting things. Right. Have a little bit of fun. Spice it up a little bit. Yeah. Also, especially just because this entire year is just so weird and kind of unpredictable. You can right. Just, it's really just a bunch of people throwing random ass guesses. You know, I watched a lot of videos like E3 predictions. Like, are they going to make a new Legacy of Cain? It's like, where are you getting this? Like, yeah. what? You're just throwing shit at the wall. That's why I always hated the, the guessing game, too, because a people, some people are so detached. Even people that talk about games are so some of them are so detached. I'm so excited about Vanquish 2. It's like I, I find that weird. It's like you're supposed to be an expert or a podcaster. You have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. You know, that, so that, that's there are a lot of people doing that. That's number one. Oh, yeah. But number two is that. Either predictions used to be really hard for me because people used to predict the things I wasn't predicting were going to happen because part of the game for me was that I wouldn't talk about things I knew. So people would actually read the predictions and then be like, Colin didn't predict this. And therefore, he knows that this is happening and it would get out of control. Like the things that people thought Ooh. PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale 2 or something. You know, I'd be like, oh, my God. No, it's guys. It's not happening. <laughs> yeah. No, never. Super Bowl Entertainment what a closed weird, seven years ago. What a <laughs> weird game. We got to do a let's play on that at some point. That'd be a good idea. We've got to bring up the so. PS3. Yeah. To do it. So, yeah, I thought that was a fun approach. And yeah. so just to remind everyone, next week we're going to do two episodes. We'll do an Xbox centric episode that I suspect will be about an hour. And then we'll do an episode on, and let me just make sure I got them all. Bethesda, Ubisoft, and Square. Devolver will be in there at some point as well, I guess. But those are the big ones. Mm-hmm. Nintendo goes Tuesday, and I don't really care. So. <laughs> Should we do a Nintendo one? <laughs> Not really. They, yeah, I don't. Because the I, thing is, it's like most of the stuff they... I think the issue, as far as it pertains to PlayStation, is that at least when you turn on the Microsoft conference, you're going to get Xbox exclusives, but there's also, you know, the fact that there's going to be things that are announced at the Xbox showcase that are going to be playable on PlayStation, and vice versa, like, as years pass, like, Things have been showed at PlayStation oh, that are playable on Xbox. But there's not a lot of multi-platform stuff that's going to be revealed at a Nintendo thing. It's all going to be Nintendo exclusive or like hey here's a new smash character surprise it's ralph nader that would be fucking wild <laughs> ralph nader uses a seatbelt. that'd be wild <laughs> it's another guy from fire emblem that's indistinguishable from all the other fire emblem, ca- yeah, fire emblem exactly. characters jeb bush uh, gets <laughs> i would love to play a smash brothers game that was just all like <laughs> presidents by the- oh that'd be awesome or even just like a marvel versus capcom i think that would work better actually by the way one of our most famous villains wart isn't in the game but didn't you want all these other characters? Here's Mr. Game and Watch. Can't stand it. Baffling. Where is Wart? Who's Wart? The bad guy from Super Mario Brothers 2. Oh, the one that was Doki Doki Panic? Yeah. Uh, that's probably why then. Mm. Birdo's not in any anything. Since... Yeah, Birdo's a schmuck though. I mean, you know, yeah. Also, as I've said many times, the, the character I've, I've, put, I've thrown it out there in the wild so many times because I, I want them to steal it. Birdo's a schmuck. Is Dr. Wily playing as Pokemon trainer. So he like, is in the background 
Oh, with all his robots? And then he throws robots in and they fight? That could be cool. Be awesome. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, know. I play Snake always, so. I haven't played Smash. I haven't played this new one at all. No? But I used to play, back in the day, I played at Ice Climbers, which they brought back, thankfully. Oh, I hate it. I hate fighting them. They're, they're annoying shit. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, I use Day to Day or Mario, so. It's pretty basic. Well, I'm a basic bitch. <laughs> So, yeah, well, and again, it's not that we're ignoring Nintendo. It's just that we're doing the Xbox episode this year kind of to take place of the Sony episode. And yeah, because so they're announcing presumably shit that is germane to our conversation here. Yeah, for sure. Chris, do you have any closing comments before we wrap things up? I think I'm all, I'm starving. You're hungry? Yeah, I'm We got to sign a few things before we go because we got to send things out to the, to the audience. Sure. So then you can get the fuck out of my apartment at your leisure. You don't have to leave. <laughs> you don't have to leave at anything. You know, you can stay and hang out, but you can also leave. I will. Oh, man. It's only going to be a few more days before we yeah. get together again. I know. We'll see each other on Sunday. We'll see each other on Monday. We'll get the episodes out Monday and Tuesday. So you have those to look forward to. If you're a patron, of course. If you're yeah. not, if you're a freeloader, <laughs> go ahead and listen on free feeds. By the way, they're getting rid of iTunes. Did you see that? What does that mean? I don't know. The pod- I use the Apple iP- uh, podcast app, rather, which is really great. I use that to listen to my podcast. I understand. They're getting rid of iTunes. What does that mean? Like they're deleting iTunes, I guess. Like you're not going to have iTunes anymore or something like that. Weird. Why? It, iTunes is terrible. I mean, yeah, but like, I mean, it's always been terrible. So I know. So I think it's taken them 15 years, but they're finally acknowledging it by getting Did they announce this at the same event that they said, we're going to sell you a monitor stand for $1,000? I think so. Or it might have been before it. But yeah, it was around. That shit's ridiculous. Time. I know. Even by Apple standards. I know. I'm, you, not, a, I'm not an Apple fanboy. I like, I, I like my iPhone. I only buy iPhones. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not into the cold. Do you Apple. understand how much you could buy for the price of one of those stands? You get two 4K monitors. For the price of a single stand. What? Yeah, I don't get it. It's a white stick. People love Apple, man. I don't know. That's too much. It is too much. It's insane. But I only bring that up because we're going to have to find out different ways for people to review the podcast now if you're a freeloader. Oh, yeah. Weird. Well, you can. Re- I think you can review it on like Stitcher and CastBox and stuff if you want. Is there going to be like... Would they delete... Are they? Are you sure they're not just rebranding it? I don't know. I hope they don't delete all those reviews just because there's like, especially with... That hinges a lot of shows. Yeah, there's also just like a ton of... His, like, I want to copy and paste them just because they're they're cool to have, you know? Like, yeah. I don't know. That's kind of the fun thing about the internet is I always assume this shit's just always going to be there. And then people and then, go around and, then and then delete it's gone. Yeah. yeah. It's like Spider-Man Web of Shadows. One day it's here and then the other day it's gone. That's right. That's Or like uh, story mode in, uh, Minecraft, in Minecraft. Minecraft, yeah. One day it's here and one day it's gone. Rip. All right, Chris, let's get the hell out of here. All righty. We thank all of you for your support, your love, your kindness. Remember, you can support the show on Patreon, patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand for early ad-free access and the ability to submit questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas to our show, as well as exclusive podcasts. The most recent exclusive podcast is actually a Q&A with the new writer of my SideQuest YouTube series, Sophia, so you can get to know her better. Uh, she's a good writer and really smart and really interesting, so go check that out if you want. Again, if you're a freeloader, enjoy the show. Let your friends and family know. Buy merch. Sacred, or it's uh, tinyurl.com slash sacred shirts. You can customize your shirts all made in the USA. Appreciate you guys out there for doing that. We've sold hundreds of sacred symbol shirts. That's awesome. Appreciate that. So thank you so much. Love you. Appreciate you. See you next time. Goodbye. Take care, guys. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product of and a registered trademark of Collins Last Stand LLC and is recorded right here in sunny Santa Monica, California, USA. This show is conceived by, is written by, and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Chris Raygun. You can find me on Twitter at No Taxation and on Instagram at CLS Moriarty. Chris is on Twitter at Chris R. Gunn and on Instagram at Chris underscore Ray underscore Gunn. Sacred Symbols is edited by Dustin Furman. Any snail mail can be sent to the CLS P.O. Box. P.O. Box 1233, Santa Monica, California, 90406. To message the show online, please use Patreon's DM service. As you know, all of Collins' Last Stand shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon, and we are eternally grateful for your kindness, generosity, and fandom. Carlos Algaret, C.J. Anderson, Morgan Ashley, Taylor Barkley, Sean Battershaw, Martin Beck, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, Mark Boggio, Eli Bosford, Barrett Boswell, Miguel Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Chris Buston, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Tom Cargill, Patrick Carper, William O'Carroll, Ryan Caulfield, Brian Chan, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, David Chestnut, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Geo Corsi, Nick Cummings, Daniel D'Amour, Colin Davenport, Daniel Delanicos, Mitchell Durkash, Knight Draft, David Ellis, Martha Emery, Joe Finn- 
Martinelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Candler Four, Fotios Frangos, Michael Gallier, Chris Galvin, Connor Gashian, Alex Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Ghanem El Ghanem, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Miranda Grubba, Tyler Harris, Kyle Hagel, Wyatt Henry, Asa Haas, Azan Isa El Ricey, Josh Yeager, John Jameson, Joshua Jonathan, Greg Julefs, Anton K, Jeremy Key, Anti Kinnanen, James Kinsel the Third, Ryan R. Kittredge, Jackson Lastiqua, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Lou and Ray Loper, Elijah Lopez, Colin Love, Josh M, Ryan T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Michael Martinez, Sean Mason, Zachariah McAdoo, John McCarthy, Joe McPartland, Dennis Meinchin, Andrew Mendoza, Christopher Middling, Albert Miranda, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Ryan Murdoch, Brian Nietzsche, Adam Nix, Donnie Nolan, George Anthony Nunez, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, David Parkhurst, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, Nicholas Perfect, James Perone, Jason Pettit, Jeff Pollard, Louis Powell, Lawrence F. Prokop, Ryan Reeves, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Mark Richardson, Tony D. Riemenschneider, Austin Riley, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, John Schultz, Michael Shanholtz, Brandon Sharkey, Toby Schutman, Glendon Cole Simper, Joshua Smallwood, Andrew Smith, Daniel Strycharsk, John Tambanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Joseph Thayer, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Alan Tremblay, Jacob Turnbaugh, Phil Van Ralt, Raymond Vargas, Michael Vecchio, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Isaac Wastman, Damon Weathers, Mike Wayant, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zuniga, Toothless Gibbon, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Homeworld Hub, Throw7, Infinite, Mad Mock Media, Fabian, Mubarak, Richter86, Hugo's Desk, Andrew, Ian, Chris, Donk2015, and Gavin. Uh, what is this? Uh, the, the PlayStation blog's description of the game in bre is brief? Oh, it's brief. Though it makes for a nice elevator. I'm going to do that all again. All right. Usually I'd like to joke around. Dustin, cut that out. I'm already sounding like an idiot on the show. You can put it at the end, though.